what up, what up? Today in AP Precalculus Land, we are going to talk about the first four sections of Unit 2. Lots of exponential stuff, growth, decay, moving it, just like the animals from Madagascar like to do. They like to do that, you know. They like to move it, move it. Just get right into it. The first section really talks about stuff you probably learned in Algebra 2, maybe even Algebra 1, and that's arithmetic and geometric sequences. Now, an arithmetic sequence is basically you add or subtract the same number to get from one number to the next, like 2, and then 5, and then 8. And you're like, oh, it looks like all you're doing is adding 3 arithmetic sequence. A geometric sequence is when you take a number and multiply it from one term to get to the next, and that term is used over and over and over again. And so you would look at this problem and say, oh, it looks like you're multiplying two every single time. That's a geometric sequence. The number you add is called the common difference. We'll get to that in a second. The number you multiply is called the common ratio. We'll get to that in a second. What we need to do is make sure we feel comfortable about the equations for each one. So the arithmetic sequence equation is given to you by a sub n, which represents the nth term of a sequence. So if I'm like the 18th term in an arithmetic sequence, you would say a sub 18. Uh, that's going to equal the first term, a sub 1 is the first term, plus n. So remember I said the 18th term, n is 18, minus 1 times that common difference, that number that you add to get to the next number every time. That is the equation for an arithmetic sequence. Again, okay, you were the nth term, right? Uh, you were the first term. Uh, N has to do with the term that you're dealing with. And D is the common difference, what you add to get from one number to the next. Then you have the geometric sequence equation, which I'll write down here to give myself a little bit more space. Slightly different, but a lot different. A sub N again, you know, the nth term, that, that hasn't changed. That's going to equal the first term, again, so far that really hasn't changed, easy to remember, times the common ratio to the n minus 1 power. So the new thing here is the fact that now it's multiplied, your first term is, to the common thing that you're dealing with. And again, we said r was common ratio. So I'm going to whip out um, some of these equations every now and then during this packet problem thing. Uh, and, uh, yeah, that's not going to go away anytime soon. Okay. All right. That takes us to exponential functions. Now, what an exponential function, generally speaking, looks like is going to look exactly like the geometric sequence. Uh, f of x is going to equal a, which is like your first term, times b, which is like your common ratio, to the x power. It's just the difference between this guy and exponential functions and geometric sequences is we're not subtracting one here. Now we're going to do a little bit of manipulation later in this uh, video. You'll see what I mean, but that is the exponential function. Exponential functions will look something like this or something like this, where what you're going to have is you're going to have a graph that starts out and then explodes, or it just kind of levels itself out, very similar to some of the rational stuff that we saw uh, in the previous chapter. Now, what do A and B stand for? A uh, just basically represents what your picture is going to look like as far as stretching or shrinking, which very, very, very important is the B. If B is greater than 1, not equal to, just greater than 1, you have what's called exponential growth, okay? So maybe you start out with two objects, and then you have 4, and then you have 8, and then you have 16. And what I'm doing is I'm multiplying by 2 every time. So in the case that I just made up, B is 2, which is greater than 1, which is exponential growth. Now I'm going to be very, very, very careful how I word this. Because you're probably thinking, well, what happens when B is less than 1? Mm. B has to be in between 0 and 1. If B was negative, the whole thing goes haywire because then all of a sudden you're saying a negative to an exponent. And then a negative to an exponent, which means you're going up and down and up and down and up and down. Because if you square a negative, it becomes positive. And if you cube a negative, it becomes negative. And if you quadruple 
a fourth, a negative, it becomes positive. And so you're going everywhere. So I'm not just going to say less than one. I'm going to say between zero and one. That is what's called exponential DK, if I knew how to spell. Uh, over there is what it would look like. So if I had like a car and I my car started out at like, I don't know, let me be realistic, $100,000, I bought it used. And then like the next year it was $50,000. And then the next year was $25,000. I'm taking half every time, which means it starts way up here and then cuts in half and then cuts in half and then cuts in half and starts to level itself out towards like a, a horizontal asymptote of some kind. So very similar very similar to the rational function stuff that we saw in the previous unit, but not the same. You know, there are connections. Really? I'm just going to get right into it. I guess one of the things that I didn't talk about, let me go back, is what if I want to move one of these things? Like, what if I want to take something that looks like that and maybe shift it up or shift it left or something like that? Let me rewrite this whole thing and add some fun facts to it before I go and do a bunch of examples. Um, if I were to take a number in front of the A and make it positive or negative, it determines whether it looks like that or it looks like that. It just simply flips it upside down. Okay. Same thing with that Y. So, so uh, a positive A may look like that. A negative A may look like that. Okay. Uh, B is just going to be B. We're not going to go inside the B. Now, you might be thinking, hold on, hold on. Whenever we wanted to move left or right, didn't we go inside the X parentheses? We did. That's not X. That's B, big difference. If I wanted to move this guy left or right, I'm going to subtract or add from the X. And what we have to be careful here, okay, what we have to be careful is, well, let me write out the whole thing. All right. So let's look at the H and the K first, and then we'll go back and talk about the A, even though I kind of brought it up just a second ago. Uh, if I wanted to move right, okay, if I wanted to move right, it's going to be a positive H, okay? So like X minus 5, you might think, oh, oh minus 5? Don't we move left? No, a minus 5 implies the opposite of this we're moving right. So if you have X minus five, move right five. X minus 10, move right 10. However, if you have X double negative, which is plus 10, you are going to move left, okay? We know with the Ks, if a number is floating around on the opposite outside, that kind of acts as a Y intercept or something along those lines, okay? A positive K just means you move up. And a negative K just means you move down. What the A does, and I forgot to talk about that earlier, is it takes your number and it either stretches it or shrinks it. A smaller A has you shrink it. A larger A has you stretch it. So this has to do with the uh, horizontal stretch. Okay. I don't think we're going to see that a whole ton because usually we're going to be given numbers. And we'll take it from there. So we're going to start right off the bat. I don't think I have any uh, calculator problems until the end. I think I just saved them for last so I don't have to move my face a bunch of times and check because that's the moneymaker. Come on. Uh, find the common difference. What am I doing to get from, well, first off, it is arithmetic. So yes, it tells us that. The common difference is what I multiply or subtract or add, <laughs> what I add to get from one number to the next. And it looks like this is negative increasing, so I'm going to add 1.25 every time, plus 1.25, plus 1.25. I'm confident in my answer. So what's the common difference? D equals positive 1.25. If our number was going down, it would be negative something. The common difference is what you always add to get from one number to the next. So if I wanted to find the next three terms, I'm going to add 1.25. So negative 5 plus 1.25 is going to be 0 0.75. And then add 1.25 to that is going to be 2. And then add 1.25 to that is going to be 3.25. Find the explicit formula for the sequence. And if you're like, explicit formula? <laughs> Is that a formula that involves more cursing? <laughs> yes. Which, uh, if you have children in the room, have them leave because I'm about to use a curse word. I'm just kidding. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. 
I wouldn't do that, but I did warn you. Uh, the explicit formula is what we wrote down on the last slide. A sub n equals a sub one plus n minus one times d. Okay, let's label everything that we know. All right, we already know that u r d, God is good. We know that u are the first term, so I'm going to call you a sub one. Uh, what else do I know? That's just about it. So the general formula for the explicit uh, formula is going to be a sub n equals the first term negative 4.25 uh, plus n, which is, I don't know, minus 1 times d, which is 1.25. Okay. Now you might look at problem D here and say, oh, let me get my calculator. Now we don't need a calculator. We, we, we might want a calculator, but we don't need a calculator. So in order to find the 88th term, N is now 88. So I'm gonna use this guy right here and say, A sub 88 is going to equal the first term negative 4.25 plus 88 minus 1 times 1.25. In other words, negative 4.25 plus 88 or 87 times 1.25. So let's just do the old fashioned way. I have all this space up here. Let's try to find out what 87 times 1.25 is. Okay, I never said it would be pretty. I just said it would be fun. All right, old fashioned way. We have, uh, that's 35. 43, carry the three, blah, blah, blah. Put a zero there. That's 14, that's 17, two zeros, uh, and then 87. So you're gonna add those up to five, seven, eight, nine, and put a dot here. I hope I did that right. I hope I did that right. I mean, that seems kind of promising. I mean, one a quarter of 88 would be 22, the Taylor Swift special. So you would add almost 22 to, on top of that. Uh, so yeah, I like it. So we have negative 4.25 plus 98.75. So working backwards, 98.75 minus 4.25 is going to be 94 and a half. If I made a mistake on that, which is which is possible, I do make mistakes from time to time. Leave a, a comment in the chat. It happens where people say you made a mistake, and then I cry for hours. <laughs> oh, I wish I could say I was joking. Next one, uh, we've got ourselves a oh, someone spilled ooze on their calculator. What were these Ninja Turtles using math stuff? Uh, while making an equation for geometric sequence. All right, so let's remind ourselves that the geometric sequence is a sub n equals a sub 1, the first term, times the common ratio times n minus 1. For those of you wondering, am I going to have to memorize these formulas for the AP exam? Yes, memorize them. Memorize them good. All right, so find the output values when the input values are 0, three and four, all oh, that ooze really got in the way. Well, let's see what it looks like we're doing. We know it's geometric. So I know that no matter what, I multiply the same exact numbers every time to get to the next guy. What do I multiply to negative 16 to get to negative eight? A half. So when you have zero, zero is going to be a half of negative eight, which is negative four. Uh, a half of negative four is negative two. A half of negative two is negative one. A half of negative one, is that what I want to do? Three and four, yep. A half of negative one is going to be negative half. And then a half of a half is going to be negative 0 0.25, a quarter. That's supposed to be 0 0.25. So let's, let me write that out here. Negative four, negative 0 0.5, and negative 0 0.25.
were the three numbers that I was supposed to come up with. Find the equation for the geometric sequence. All right, be careful. The first term in this guy is not negative 18. The first term is when n is 1. And when n is 1, we have negative 2. So negative 2 is a sub 1. Be careful. We already said that our ratio was a half. So let me write that up here. Our common ratio is what I multiply from one number to get to the next. And that's a half. And that's really all the information I need. A sub n equals the first term, which was negative 2, times r, which was a half. So I like to wrap that in parentheses, even though it may not be necessary. So that dot's not really necessary. It's all good. To the n minus 1. OK. Find when x is 6. So in this case, x is 6 implies n is 6. So what I need is I need the sixth term, which I don't have. And I'm not going to keep this process going on any further. I'm going to try to do this uh, using the formula that I just came up with. So a sub 6 is going to equal negative 2 times 1 half to the 6 minus 1 power. And the 6 minus 1 power is the same as the fifth power. Now, for me, with problems like this, I prefer to deal with fractions. You know, a lot of you might be like, let's do decimals and let's just keep the pattern going. No, because for whatever reason, dividing decimals are just not good for me. If that's the way you want to go about it, that's fine. This is how I'm going to go about it. Okay. I know that two times two is four. So one over two times one over two is one over four because you do one times one and two times two. So what does that mean? That means if I do 1 times 1 times 1 times 1 times 1, 5 times, I get 1 on the top here. If I do 2 times 2, 4, times 2, 8, times 2, 16, times 2, I get 1 over 32. Multiply 1 over 32 by 2, and you get 1 over 16. Since that's negative 2, you get negative 1 over 16, and that's going to be what happens when x is 6. So whatever decimal that is, I, I, I don't know, uh, uh, negative 0 0.052895314159667. If I'm wrong on that, leave a comment. Rewrite the equation of b, okay, for b, using x minus 1 as an exponent. Okay. I think I, when I created this problem, I meant to do something else because that's stupid of me to do that. I think I must have meant to do something else. I think I meant to, um, I'm not going to go back and change it. We will see manipulation of, of equations later on in this. So I'm not going to lose sleep over that. Easy problem. Easy problem. All right. Hmm. No calculator. Let's move my face. Uh, the population of a bacteria is modeled in the table below. An exponential function can be used to model the data. So I stole this problem off the internet and made a bunch of examples off of it. So day one, I have 10. Day two, I have 20. Day three, I have 40. Day four, I have 80. I... Okay, so I can see the exponential part. Every single day, I'm doubling the amount of bacteria that I have. What happens to the bacteria each day? I'm doubling it. Okay, it's like a, I'm doubling, like we're a, a city in Ireland. Times two for all you laymans out there. How much bacteria existed at the beginning? Okay, well, at the beginning would imply day zero. And if I multiply to get to the next day by two, then I would divide by two to get to the first day, which is day zero, which is five. Ten divided by two is five. So I started out with five at the very beginning. Write an equation to represent this data. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use uh, just a regular old standard uh, equation that looks like this. I did a bad job getting myself uh, in uh, space. So here is what a, an exponential equation looks like. A times b to the x. 
okay? Now, B is kind of like the R in the uh, geometric sequence. B is what I'm doing to get from what number to the next. In this case, B is 2. So what I have so far is A times 2 to the X. How do you find A? Well, it would be really nice if I got rid of that 2 to the X. Oh, you know how I can get rid of that 2 to the X? If only X was 0. If X was 0, this would become 2 to the 0. Uh, and I know, I know that 2 to the 0 is 1. And so that would just make A all by itself. So if, if I were to plug in 0 and 5, I would get 5 equals a times 2 to the 0, which means 5 equals a times 1, which means a is 5. So putting it all together, now that we know that, and now that we know that, the equation that we can come up with is y equals 5, 2 to the x. So a much faster way of handling this problem, okay, is if we were to start out with y equals a b to the x, b is your common ratio, what you do every time, a is always going to be what happens when x is zero. So find out when x is zero, that's going to be your five. I just did a little bit of work to get there just to find out that this is going to be my guy at the end of the day. Okay, so if you're wondering, is this the geometric formula? No, but close. Because the geometric formula is set up for you to deal with the first term. This guy is set up for you to deal with the zeroth term. And it would make zero sense that if I gave you, look at all these numbers, two, four, six, eight, you're not gonna look at the zeroth term for two, four, six, eight because you're not given the zeroth term. So that's the main difference between the two formulas. Arithmetic deals with first term, a sub 1, and geometric deals with the zeroth term, regular a. Now that you know, okay, what is the domain of this data? Well, if this is a real-life problem, I'm not going to go back in time. So the domain of the data is going to start out at zero, and it's going to go on forever if I choose to do that way. No negatives. It wouldn't make sense. If you were to say plug in negative X, that means, oh, let's go back in time before all this started. You can't do that. It's ridiculous. Ridiculous. I'm going to use this formula right there to predict the amount of bacteria on day eight. Another, another fun-filled math equation for me. So I have Y equals five times two to the eighth. Okay. You ready? Some of you might know what 2 to the 8th is. I think it's 256. We'll get there. I'm not sure. 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. Uh, wait. 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256. 256. 256. I don't know if that's what I said, but 256. 5 times 256. Don't know what that is. So let's do the old fashioned math route. Five times 256. I'm doing this kind of the long way, but who cares? You become 30, drop the zero, you become 25, drop two zeros, you become 10, add those up, and you get zero, eight, two, one. And if I were to keep this pattern going, I would probably get that. At day six, I would get 320. And at day seven, I would get 640. And so that's a double of 640. So I did it right. So either way you want to do it, I can do it. Moving right along. Let's move my face again. No calculators. Calculators are for the weak. <gasps> A negative exponent. Yuck. Rewrite this equation in three different ways. Okay. I like a challenge. Um, I could write this out in like a affinity different ways. 
But one of the ways that I can rewrite this out is the three is always going to be three. There's nothing that you can do about it. So way number one that we will rewrite this out is let's turn that four into two squared. Okay, so let's turn that four into two squared. So f of x equals three times two squared to the negative x. Okay, now remember a couple problems ago when I said like turn it into x minus one and I was like, oh, well, I, that was a dumb mistake by me. I must be meaning to do something later on in the video. Here we are. When you have something in parentheses taken to an exponent, you multiply exponents. So what this final guy is going to look like is f of x equals three times two to the negative two x. Okay. So that's one way you can do it. That's one way you can do it. Okay, it didn't tell me how I had to do it. I'm making it up as I go along. Uh, another way, I have a negative exponent. I don't like negative exponents. Usually when you learn in eighth grade math that if you have negative exponents, you move it to the other side of a fraction bar. So you might be looking at this and saying, other side of the fraction bar, there is no fraction bar, so make a fraction bar. So if I wanted to, I can now turn this guy into three times, move the exponent, move the whole thing to the other side of the fraction bar and make the exponent positive. So one over four to the X. And when I put that all together and make it look a little bit prettier, I can do F of X equals three over four to the X. So that's just another option. Just another option that I can use. What else? Um, what if I decided to, what did I do before? X plus one, make it X plus one. I, I'm gonna turn this into X plus one. Just because like in this last problem, I, a couple problems ago, I wanted to do that. X minus one, it's, is it already X minus one? No, it's not already X minus one. So if I wanna do this and make this X minus one, how can I pull that off? All right, let's find out. Um, if I wanted to make this have the exponent regular X minus one, first off, I have to use this formula right here. Why don't I make it negative X minus one? Why not? Okay, why not? I have four, right, to the negative X. I wanna make this negative X minus one. How can I make this negative X minus one? We remember from up here that when I have an exponent to an exponent, you multiply the exponents. This would imply that I take a negative exponent and I subtract one from it. When you multiply two terms, like x cubed times x to the third, you add exponents. So that's going to equal x to the fifth. What I'm going to do here then is I'm going to include a four to the negative one. Now, if I do that, if I do just randomly include a four to the negative one to this, so, so that's what I have right there. So that's what I have right there. And this gives me what I want. This gives me the negative X plus negative one. That gives me the equation that I wanna do just for this one example. I'm not allowed to just multiply any number by four to the negative one. So I have to balance that out along this side. So on the right side, if I want to balance out the fact that I multiplied four to the negative one, I have to multiply four to the positive one. So again, I'm, I'm just turning this into a very bizarre problem because it says write this equation in three different ways. In a previous problem, I had mentioned X minus one, so I'm doing negative X minus one. And in order to turn negative X into negative X minus one, I take the base and multiply it to that base to the negative one. But I can't just take something and multiply it by four to the negative one. So to balance it out, I multiply it to four to the regular one, didn't mean to do that, four to the regular one, and that balances things out. 
So now this gives me the equation f of x equals 4 to the regular 1, or just 4, times 3, times 4 to the negative 1, times 4 to the negative x. 4 times 3 is 12. 4 to the negative 1 times 4 to the negative x means I add these guys and I get 4 to the negative x minus 1. So usually when you have problems that look like this, okay, this is how it's going to usually show up on like a AP test. Very rare. I can't imagine a scenario where the AP people create a problem that say, hey, just create any three problems you want and we'll have the graders who grade these things deal with it. No, they'll give you options. And they might be like, hey, look at that guy right there. Which one of these is an example of that? And all of these would be the same exact thing as that. So this comes from, I believe, the fourth, maybe the third section where it asks you to manipulate exponential stuff. And so that's what we did. That's what we did. Make a table of values. So I'm going to have, let's do negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. The reason why I'm not going to go crazy and make a ton of these is this is exponential. And with the exponential functions, numbers get bigger faster. Or in this case, numbers get smaller faster. So I'm going to do a little bit of mental math. Bear with me. Okay, if I want to plug in negative one, this becomes three times four to the negative negative one. Three times four to the first is 12. If I were to plug in zero, this guy becomes three times four to the negative zero or three times four to the zero, which is three times one. Uh, if I were to do this guy right here, this becomes 3 times 4 to the negative 1, which means 3 times 4 to the negative 1 is 1 over 4. So that becomes 3 fourths. Sorry, I had to quick pause. My son's watching YouTube really loud upstairs. If I had to plug in 2, that would be the same as 3 times 4 to the negative 2, which is 3 times 1 over 4 squared, which is 3 times 1 16th. Oh, almost my favorite Bible verse. So John 3 16th. I didn't do that on purpose. It's just look at God. Uh, if I were to do 3, uh, that would be 3 times 1 over 4 to the third, which is 3 times 1 over 64. So three sixty-fourths. Okay. And you can see this is why I'm not gonna go crazy coming up with a bunch of numbers because like three over sixty-four is like point oh something, like point oh one ish, uh point oh two maybe. That's basically zero. So we we know what's gonna happen, and this takes us to part C, sketch the function. Uh this is exponential decay. Okay, this is exponential decay. It's actually not exponential decay. You'll see what it is. I'm speaking too much. Uh, let's plug this in. It actually is exponential decay because I could rewrite this as. Do I have it? How come I never? Oh, here's a fourth way that I can write this out. You ready? This is why this is exponential decay. I can write this guy out as three times four to the negative one times x which is the same thing as three times one over four to the X. There's a fourth way. So that's why this shows up. Doesn't seem like it's exponential decay at first because of that four, but it is exponential decay. So I have negative one way up here at 12. Boop. And then at zero three, which we kind of saw from a previous problem that when that's zero, you know, that's my Y intercept. So boop. And then when you plug in one, you get 0.75, so something down here. And when you plug in another one, it's basically zero. And you plug in another one, it's basically zero. And you plug in another one. So what's going to happen is you start way up here, and then you eventually level out at zero. Now, will you ever hit zero? No, because you're just going to keep dividing by four every time. Divide by four, divide by four, divide by four, divide by four. And even if you keep dividing 0. 0.000000 divided by four, you can always get just a little bit smaller. So what we would say 
is that the limit as x approaches positive infinity of f of x is going to be zero, which is not that. This is saying, let's go the other way. What's the limit as x approaches negative infinity? Well, if I go to negative infinity, it's going to be super big, super big. So positive infinity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Hmm. All right, so we have two exponential equations. We have what appears to be a wacky looking decay problem and a wacky looking maybe decay. Yeah, it is a decay problem. That's not my issue, though. I don't need to worry about that. All I have to worry about right off the bat is find out what P of 4 is. So P of 4 means let's substitute 4 in for every n. So 4 to the negative 2 times 4 plus 6. Negative 2 times 4 is negative 8. Negative 8 plus 6 is going to be 4 to the negative 2, which is the same thing as, oh, a negative exponent. Let's move it to the bottom and make it positive. And 1 over 4 squared is 1 over 16. See? See it? See it? Now it gets bananas. B-A-N-A-N-A-S, Gwen Stefani. I need to find out when f of n equals p of n. f of n, and I'm going to write it up here, so let's, let's cut things off, and hopefully I have enough space for c. We'll see. f of n is 1 over 64 in parentheses to the n plus 2. Set that equal to... P of n, which is 4 to the negative 2n plus 6. Now, in order to solve exponential functions without, without logs, because we don't know what logs are yet, but in order to solve these without logs, you need to make sure that the bases are the same. They're not. Is there a way that I can write out 1 over 64 to make it look like 4 to the something power? Yes, didn't I just do that? Didn't I just do that like back here? Uh, I did. I just erased it. Uh, if I have 4 squared is 16 and 4 to the third is 64. So I could write this out as 1 over 64, 1 over 4. 4 to the third to the n plus 2 equals 4 to the negative 2n plus 6. Now, that's not 4. That's 1 over 4. So let's move this guy up and make its exponent negative. Okay, 4 to the negative third to the n plus 2 equals 4 to the negative 2n plus 6. Now, is that 4? No, because it's 4 to the negative third. I need to get rid of that negative third. We already know from a previous problem that if I have an exponent to an exponent, you multiply exponents. But, oh, do be careful because you have to make sure you distribute. So this becomes 4 to the negative 3n minus 6. That's going to equal 4 to the negative 2n plus 6. Now that I have 4 to the blur equals 4 to the blur, I can get rid of those 4s and set those uh, equal to each other. So when you have two numbers of the same base equal to each other, set their exponents equal to each other. Negative 3n minus 6 equals negative 2n plus 6. So let's add 3n to both sides so that I can make this positive n. That'll make my life a whole lot easier. So negative 6 equals positive n plus 6. And one last step is subtract 6, subtract 6. f of n equals p of n if negative 12 is n. Oh, isn't that fun? I love that. Oh, mm. 
Good old algebra. Good old algebra. And it's worse now. Find f of n over p of n equals 1. So I have to take this guy and divide that guy and set it equal to 1. I got it. A lot of the same rules are going to apply. Uh, so let's just set it up and be a little lazy. f of n was 1 over 64 to the n plus 2 over 4 to the negative 2n plus 6. Now, I can simplify something like this. If I, if I have like 4 to the 8th over 4 to the 3rd, when those guys are just 4, when they're the same exact base, you just subtract exponents. So you would get like 4 to the 5th power, right? Well, didn't I just turn that into 4 to the something power? <gasps> I did. So using the same process, and we're going to wave our hands and pretend that we did everything again, we know that 1 over 64 times n to the, or to the n plus 2 is the same thing as 4 to the negative 3n minus 6. So once you have the same bases, you can do a little bit of manipulation. Okay, now that we have a base to the stuff divided by the same base to the stuff, we can subtract those things. So we have 4 to the uh, negative 3n minus 6 minus all of that negative 2n plus 6. And remember, the goal here is that we need to have it set equal to 1. So this becomes 4 to the negative 3n minus 6 plus 2n minus 6 equals 1. Combine like terms, negative n minus 12 equals one. Ah, oh, this is a shame. If only that was equals four to the something power, then I can do what we did here. Wait a minute. <gasps> four to the zeroth power is one. Oh, I can. And now that I have four to the stuff equals four to the stuff, then this stuff equals this stuff. And negative n minus 12 equals zero. And then you add 12 and negative n equals uh, 12 and n equals negative 12 once again. Look at that. Oh, it all makes sense. And if you were like, hey, dummy, and that's you talking to me. Hey, dummy. Couldn't you just have looked at this guy and said f of n divide both sides by p of n. And if you divide both sides by p of n, you get f of n over p of n equals one. You just wasted all this time? Well, yeah, I guess I did. Oh, well, <laughs> it's my video. <laughs> and, and, and more, the longer the video, the more money I get. So, I'm hoping that I can um, make so much money that I can keep my day job and not have to panic all the time. <sighs> Calculator problem. All right, so what we have is we have ourselves a chart, bunch of numbers, car. Uh, the value of a car over its first four years is shown in the table. Use exponential regression to model to find uh, an equation for the car's value. So what this concept is called is called depreciation. When you buy something brand new, it loses its value over time. But it wouldn't make sense. Like if I were to buy a car, it wouldn't make sense for me to be like that. What did I say before? That $100,000 car, it loses its value $25,000 every year because that applies after five years. I Its value is now negative something and that doesn't make sense. So maybe it halves every year or it, it, it's, uh, it loses its value by it's now 60% of what it used to be every year. And so you have yourself exponential regression. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at this guy. Uh, we're going to throw it in our calculator. We're going to answer all of these questions using the process called exponential regression. Okay, exponential regression model. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go to stat edit and I'm going to use the exact numbers that they give us. Zero, one, two, three, four. Now, what I'm going to do for the value is so that I don't over confuse myself. I'm going to use the actual numbers. So I'm not going to type out 32. I'm going to type out 32,000. I think that'll be easier to do it now, get that out of the way now and not have to overthink it. 27,000.2 means 200. Okay, 23.1 means 23,100, and I almost screwed that up. 23,100. And then we've got 19,650. And then we've got 16,700. All right. Boom. So let's get out of here. Let's go to stat, calc, exponential regression, I believe is all the way down to zero. There you is, and hit enter. And what I'm gonna do is I know the next two problems that are coming up ahead. I'm gonna make sure that I store my regression equation into the y equals part. So I'm gonna go to that, I'm gonna hit vars. I'm gonna go to y vars, function, enter, and now when I have to do parts B and C, it won't be so bad. I don't have to type out so much. Calculate. And there you have it. You can see that A is awfully, awfully, awfully close to the beginning value of the car, which it is. You know, that's almost $32,000. I have a feeling I'll mention that in a second. There's my B. So let's put it all together. All right, so the equation, as unpleasant as it is, um, let's do f of x, maybe I should do this, c of t, c of t, which means the car over t years is going to equal a times b to the x, a was 3, 1, 9, 9, 6.070 uh, times, what was it, 0.849, so 0.850, 0 0.850 to the uh, t power. Now, this implies that at time equals zero, the value of the car was around $31,000 dollars and nine hundred ninety six blah, 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 which is about right. Okay, it's about right. So this guy is not completely out of the ordinary. So let's see what happens to the car's value uh, or how after how many years will the car's value be $100,000. So before I even set this up, okay, before I even set this up, what that implies is the car's value is going to be 100 or $10,000. So $10,000 is gonna equal 31, nine nine six point oh seven oh times zero point nine five oh to the t now what i can do is i can do this two different ways and i think what i'm going to do just to make life a little bit easier is i'm just going to graph that in my calculator graph that in my calculator see where those lines intersect and that should give me the car's value We'll do that. Be right back. So now what I need to do is I care about finding when this guy is equal to $10,000. So I'm going to go to Y equals. I'm going to see that my equation is there. And in my other equation, I'm going to set it equal to $10,000. Now what I could have done here is I could have subtracted 10,000 from this whole thing and found the zero, but I'm just going to find out where these two intersect. When I hit graph, I don't expect to see anything. Why? Because all the action is happening way up here. So if I wanted to see something, maybe I'll change my window to, I don't know, the X max or Y max rather was, what was it, a $32,000 car? So let's bump it up to 33,000, okay? Hit graph. 
and we can see that the value of the car starts out way up here and then over time after a year here it is and after two years there it is that red line represents when the value of my car is going to be ten thousand dollars so i need to find out where these two lines intersect so i'm going to hit second trace it takes me to calc and i'm going to go to intersect the fun thing about intersect is all you have to do is hit enter 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 boom 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 and there you have an intersection of 7.1536 so we'll round that up accordingly before i even move on i think that is an eight i think when i drew it out i made it look like a nine so maybe i accidentally said it was a nine but it's an eight uh so i'm going to go back and fix that after typing that all in in my calculator the t that i ended up getting was 7.156 so 7.156 years. So like February, I don't know, maybe March. Now this is the same exact type of problem. When will the car uh, be half of its original value? When? So same exact thing, but I know that the original value of the car was $32,000. So somewhere after year four, I'm going to hit $16,000 and that's going to be 31996.070 uh, times 0 0.850 to the T and we'll do the same exact thing that we did in part B for part C. So let's do it again. And we're going to use, uh, what number? Half of it. So that's one, six, zero, zero, zero. If I hit graph, the only thing that's going to change is that red line. And now we do the same exact thing. We need to find out where they intercept. So second calc, uh, intersect five, enter, enter, enter. We have 4.262 stuff. So we'll round that up accordingly. All right, so the time for this one is a little after four, so 4.264 years, which makes about, doesn't make sense, because after four years, we were at $16,700, so if I wanted just a flat $16,000, it's probably going to be at some point uh, after four years, so yeah, there you have it. Depreciation. All right. A father complained. Oh, those dads always be complaining. Oh, a calculator. A follow com father complained that his son's allowance of $5 per week was too much. His son replied, okay, dad, how about this? You give me a penny for the first day of the month, two cents for the second, four cents for the next, eight cents for the next, and then every day and so on and so forth until you're done. And the dad's like, oh, I can do this. I, I, I like this. This is fun. Okay. You asked for it, Dad. You asked for it. Write an equation for this scenario. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make a small table. And we're going to do X and Y. And on day one, you gave that, you gave that kid, uh, what was it? A penny. And then let's double it. And then four cents the next, eight cents the next. So let's pretend I didn't say double. Let's pretend that I have no clue what's going on. Although I do know it's exponential. But let's just write that out. Yeah. Eight cents for the next. And every day for the rest of the month, find an equation for this scenario. We're going to use exponential regression again. So let's run to our calculator and see what happens. All right, so let's see where this little brat, how much he's going to make money. Let's come up with an equation. We started out with a table. We made our own table, so let's just use that. We have day one, day two, day three, day four. Day one, uh, he had a penny. Day two, he had two cents. Day three is now four cents. And day four is now eight cents. Does that make sense? Hee <laughs> hee. Now let's find out our equation. Let's quit out second mode stat 
exponential regression, if you go over to calculus zero, so let's just double check, yes, enter, 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 and there you have it. There's our formula. Okay, so the equation that we got was y equals a 0 0.005 times 2 to the x power. How much will his son get on day 31? Let's find out. Now, what I forgot to do in the previous problem is I forgot to store this formula into y equals. So let me remind you how to do that. We have to go through the whole process again of regression. So calc zero is exponential regression. But when I store my regression equation, I'm going to go to vars, y vars, and store it into y1. Okay, so when I hit calculate, I get the same exact function that I had before. But now when I hit y equals, <laughs> there it is. It's just, God forbid, it gives you 0 0.005. It has to do all of that. So thank you, TI84+. plus. You guys are great. We care about what happens on day 31. It can't be that bad. I mean, you're only getting a penny to start out with. It can't be that bad. Let's go to table by hitting second graph. And at day zero, that doesn't matter. But day one, you have a penny, and day two, you have two cents. We knew that would happen. Let's just keep going. Let's keep going. Day 10, oh, great. We owe him $5. Yippee. Uh oh. Oh, boy. oh no. Oh, no, no, no. No, no, no. Why are kids so freaking expensive? Look at that. Holy cow. That's $10 million. I don't have that kind of money. I'm not PewDiePie over here. Oh, let's write that down. Oh, that turd, he tricked us. He tricked us to the tune of $10 million. Holy cow, $10,777,418. And let's not forget the 24 cents. Oh, I hate kids. I hate them so. Actually, I love kids. I have four of them. Rewrite the equation if the son started out with five cents, doubled his money every third day, and allowed and, and owed his dad $45. So, all right, so now what I have to do is rewrite the equation if the son started out with five cents, doubled his money every third day, and owed his dad $45. Let's not worry about the $45 until the very end. You'll see why in a second. Uh, on day one, uh, five cents. Every third day, which means day four, it's doubled. And then day seven, it's now 20 cents, so 0 0.2. I don't know why I wrote it out like that. And on day 10, it is now 0.4. So let's type that information into our calculator and see what we get, and then we'll deal with that $45 in a second. All right, last but not least, let's do the same thing, but with new values, okay? So let's go to stat, edit, don't know why I went over to calc there, and let's type our uh, values in. We have day one, and then three days after that, and then three days after that, and then three days after that. Every three days, stuff happens, okay? Uh, we start out with five cents, so that's point. 05, enter, uh, and that's 0.1, enter, that's 0.2, enter, and that's 0.4, enter. Let's go to second, quit, stat, Calc, uh, zero it was, right? Zero. I don't need to still store this. I just need to do this and write this out. Okay, so this equation is much, much, much worse. Y equals 0 0.3968, so 397 to the 1.259, so 1.2. Uh, five, actually six zero. That's what we're going to have to do, uh, to the X power. Oh, he owed his dad 45 bucks minus 45. That's it. 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 
and we're done. Uh, thanks for watching. Um, this covers everything from the first four sections of chapter unit two, whatever you want to call it. So, um, yeah, yeah, just, I'm getting a lot of requests to make more and more and more of these videos. So that's just what I'm going to do. So please be patient. Uh, this is the first year that anyone's doing AP pre-calculus. So, uh, yeah, but thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it helps. Uh, let me know if it does. Cause you know, the, the comments, the few comments that I get are like, this really helps. I love you. That's what keeps me going. That and the sweet money that I make from my YouTube, which is barely nothing. Bye. Mm, what up, what up? Today we're going to talk about 2.5 through 2.8, which has a lot to do with exponential stuff, has a lot to do with, as you can see, inverses. What is that? Uh, some composites. Let's just get right into it. We're going to talk about exponential modeling first. Okay. Now, an exponential function is in the form f of x or y equals a times b to the x. Now, if b is positive and greater than 1, you have what's called exponential growth. Now, the reason why I said positive and greater than one is because I'm preparing myself for this next guy. If B is positive and less than one, in other words, between one and zero, you have what's called decay. Now, exponential growth is going to look like this. Exponential decay is not going to be the flipped version of it, but it's going to look like this. Now, what does A have to do with it? A has to do with how stretched out it becomes or skinny it becomes. The larger the number, the faster it goes up. The larger or the smaller the A, the longer it takes to go up. If A is negative, then you're looking at this guy getting flipped upside down and that guy also getting flipped upside down. So A kind of determines, you know, uh, very much like when you were doing with horizontal shrink. Okay, pretty much the same exact idea, where if you were to multiply a number to the entire f of x, which is kind of what we're doing here, it makes things skinnier and wider. Now, what's also important to note about exponential modeling is when I graph these guys, okay, they all level out at some point to zero. So growth looks like that. Decay looks like that, where everything seems to level out to zero. Okay, and that's going to be your range. Once I manipulate A or add a number, that's when things shift and things change, but we'll get there when we have to get there. Exponential modeling. Okay, modeling, something I did a ton of in, in college. Now, composite functions. Okay, a composite function can look one of two things. Uh, if I give you something like G of F of X, Okay, that means you're going to take f of x and plug it into g. I could also write that, that out as goth, which is a sport. Uh, so, you know, if I were to look at something like this guy right here, okay? Uh, and if I were to be like, what is f of, I'm literally making this up, f of g of one. And if I were to look at this picture right here, I would say, okay, well, let's do the inside first. Let's do the inside most interior part. G of one, according to this is three. All right. So this is saying find F of three. X is three. F of three is now negative 2.5. So it's a two-step process for you to get a final result. Now, I believe I created these to be the same exact thing. So, you know, I could also plug stuff into one thing and get the other. That would work just fine. But I'm going to wait to do that until I get to a bunch of examples because I don't want to overdo it beforehand. I think this is, I have like a lot of slides on here. I don't want to do too much. Okay, not yet. Inverse functions. Now, I actually am going to do it right here. Two things to know about how to find an inverse function. And let me just do one of them. Uh, let me do the uglier one, G. Uh, this is how you find the inverse, okay? So I like to call, I'm going to call that Y, just to make my life a little bit easier. Whenever you're being asked to find an inverse function, step number one is flip the X and the Y. 
Okay, so I'm going to make that look like x equals 4y squared minus 1. That's step 1. Step 2 is you're going to solve for the new y. So you add 1 to both sides. So x plus 1 equals 4y squared. Divide everything by 4. So you have y plus 1 over 4 equals uh, y squared. And in this case, you square root both sides. Don't forget to attach your positive and negative whenever you're uh, square rooting. Uh, so that gets me positive or negative square root of x plus 1 over the square root of 4, which is 2, equals regular y now. The last step, second to last step, let's flip this and make it look prettier. Y equals positive or negative x root x plus 1 over 2. And the last thing you're going to do is you're now going to call it the inverse, which, is, which looks like that. Now, that's important thing number one. That is how you deal with it analytically or algebraically or however you want to view that. Now, the way you would deal with this from a graphical point of view is if I asked you to graph that, okay, if I asked you to graph G, no big deal. G is going to look something like this, something like that. Now, the graph of an inverse is you drawing out <laughs> the perfect equation y equals x and you reflecting it over y equals x. So basically what happens is the reflection is going to show up that way. So this guy is now going to look something like this. Definitely not an exact thing, but what it is is if you were to take that black dotted line and fold it over, okay, the two graphs are going to fold onto each other. Okay, so that's how you look at an inverse graphically. Can you draw that dotted line there and fold it over? In this case, yes, even though I'm a terrible artist. And if I wanted to find it algebraically, that's how you found it algebraically. So, can I do problems now? No. This is very important. This is something that I, for whatever reason, struggled with up until uh, pre-calculus, but it's not that bad. A residual plot is if I give you a bunch of data, if I'm like, hey, look at this... Um, information if i'm taking like the temperature over the course of a couple days and i use that temperature and i create a line of best fit not every single dot is going to hit that line of best fit perfectly some dots are going to go above and some dots are going to go below a residual is how far above or below your value is uh compared to the line of best fit so if I were looking at this and, you know, if I were to use this as a real life thing at X equals zero, I get two, two lives above my line of best fit. This guy lives above my line of best fit. This guy lives below my line of best fit. But I should be able to look at this and say, yeah, all right. So my dots don't fit this line perfectly, but is the linear equation that I created here good? Yeah. And here's how I can determine that. Okay, this is what a residual plot looks like. A residual plot is if you were to take your line of best fit, make it horizontal, so like tilt it to the side, and look at the dots above and below. Now, I'm going to, oh, can I clear it? I can't erase. It won't let me erase. Nope. So basically, a residual plot looks like this. Do I have a picture over here? No, I don't. So if I were to look at just this guy right here, ignoring these lines, I have a dot above, a dot above, a dot below, a dot below, a dot on, above, below, below. There's no pattern. There's no obvious pattern that's going on with my residual points. If you don't have like an obvious pattern on your residual plot, then your linear equation that you choose here is a good guess. It's a good equation to use. So like when I look at these guys, when I look at these residual plots, and when I'm talking about patterns, right, if I were to look at this and say, look, this guy here represents a linear equation, this represents a linear equation, is a linear equation appropriate for this? The answer to this guy is no. Since there's a pattern that looks very quadratic going on here, Plot one does not represent a good linear equation because the pattern is above, 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 below, 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 coming back up, coming back up, above, above, above. That's a pattern. 
So is that guy. My lights just went out. Perfect. And no one will ever notice. Um, so that's a pattern too, because it's above, above, above. It looks quadratic. So in cases like plots one and two, these are nonlinear. The residual, or the, a linear equation does not fit this data. What about you? You might look at that and say, there's no way you're going to talk about all those scattered plots being linear. They are. This is linear. Okay. Now, the reason why this is linear is if you were to pretend that this guy is a line of best fit, these dots are all over the place, which means the linear equation seems to fit the data. Okay, so residual plots are very strange, but what you need to understand is if there's an obvious pattern, you would say that these guys do not fit a linear model. If the pattern is all over the place, like you saw that it was here, you would say that it does fit a pattern, a linear pattern. So now I believe I can get into a bunch of problems. So let's move my face, even though you can barely see it. Let's move my face over there. Let's answer a bunch of problems. Okay, let y of 1 equal f of x. Okay, y of sub 2 equal g of x and y sub 3 equal the inverse of g of x. Okay, find f of 3. So your f, your g, and your g inverse. f of 3 is 24. Okay, simple. f of g of 2 means that I'm going to start out by going to g of 2. So g of 2 is 10. So g of 2 is 10. So now I need to find out what f of 10 is because g of 2 is 10. f of 10 is 3,072. Okay? Find g of g inverse of 5. So here's g, uh, g, oh, I erased it. g inverse of 5. So here's 5 is 1. So g of 1 is going to be 5. Well, that makes sense. There's a little rule that says that the inverse of an inverse or f of its own inverse is going to equal x. So f of f inverse of 5 should be 5. Uh, f of f inverse of 8 should be 8 and vice versa, which takes us to this guy right here. Because if you were to go to find out what the g inverse of 7 is, you're going to find out that it's 1.4. So you trying to find out what g of 1.4 is, is impossible for this problem. However, you know that the function of its inverse is going to be the number that you plug in. So I can bypass all of this because this guy right here is impossible and say that the answer is 7 anyway based off of that rule right there. How exciting. Okay. What the heck am I asking here? Find f of g of 1. <laughs> all right, let's do that first. This is me asking you this, f of g of 1. So g of 1 is 5. So f of 5 is 96. Okay, I got that. Plus 3 times the inverse g of 10. So that was the inverse. So that's 2 minus 2. So plus 6 minus 2 is plus, what was that, 90? Oh, that's 96. 96 plus 6 minus 2 is going to be a perfect hundo. Oh, man, I don't think I meant for that to happen when I created this problem, but it happened, and look at that. Look at God. I kind of like the lights being out. It's, it creates an ambiance. I should always record these at home, but I don't have time. Consider the two functions, f of x and g of x. Find f of g of 3. All right. So g of 3. g of 3, that's supposed to be a g. g of 3 is going to be 3 squared minus 3 times 3, 
which is 9 minus 9, which is 0. So f of g of 3 is f of 0. f of 0 is going to be 2 times 0 plus 1, which is 0 plus 1, which is 1. Bang! Now this guy I'm working a little backwards. Now I want g of f of 2. So f of 2 is going to be 2 times 2, which is 4, plus 1 is going to be 5. So I need g of f of 2, which means g of 5. g of 5 is going to be 5 squared minus 3 times 5, so 25 minus 15, which is 10. Determine the domain and range of f of g of x. Well, that means I have to find f of g of x. Now, the way I find f of g of x without plugging in a number is I start out with f, and then what I do is I replace every x with g of x. Start out with f and replace every x with g of x. So f of g of x, f of g of x, and I'm using my patriotic colors, is going to be 2 times whatever g of x is plus 1. So g of x is x squared minus 3x. Here's a different color, different color x squared minus 3x. So now it's distributed property. So 2x squared minus 6x uh, plus 1. And what I'm supposed to do is determine the domain and range of that. So I know that my domain is going to be uh, everything because this is going to be some type of, um, this is gonna be some type of quadratic opening upwards. It's gonna go through one. So my domain is going to be all real numbers. So I can write that out as negative infinity to positive infinity. My range, what I should have done is I should have put this in my no calculator or in my calculator section. So whatever the minimum is, and I, I could probably calculate that out using calculus, but I'm not going to do calculus. I, I would be very surprised if you'd be asked to do this without the use of a calculator. I created this problem anyway, and that's what I get. So the range is whatever the minimum is, and I'm not going to go above and beyond, whatever the minimum is to infinity. All right, describe f of g of x plus 3. Well, I found f of g of x. So literally just by adding 3, it's not asking me to do a whole lot more than describe it. This is me just moving it up 3 units. That's it. Plus 3, move it up 3 units. So whatever that guy is, up 3 more. Boom. Done. Easy peasy. All right, so let f of x equals 4x minus 6, g of x equals 2x squared plus 1. Find the inverse function of each. Okay, so very similar to what we had at the very beginning. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do f of x here. I'm going to always swap out the f of x with y for the time being. Okay, step number one, change the x and the y, swap them. Solve for the new y. Add 6 to both sides. Okay, divide everything by 4. Y is going to equal X plus 6 over 4. But the last thing we need to do is don't make it Y, make it F. Inverse of X equals Y plus 6 over 4. Okay, F inverse. Bada bing. Uh, the next guy, not as pleasant, but we saw one very, 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 very similar to the very beginning. In fact, it looks like it's the same thing. I can't imagine me doing that, but maybe I did. 
Uh, we've got y equals 2x squared plus 1. Swap the x and the y. So x equals 2y squared plus 1. Subtract 1, subtract 1. So y, x minus 1 equals 2y squared. Divide everything by 2, divide everything by 2, cross u out. So I have x minus 1 over 2 over 2 is going to equal to y squared. In order to solve for the y, you have to square root both sides. Don't forget your plus and minus. So now you have y equals that, but I'm going to write it out as g inverse of x equals positive or negative uh, big square root of x minus 1 over 2. Now, I'm not going to rationalize the function. I'm not going to worry about the fact that there's a 2 on the bottom. I'm going to leave it like that. Sue me. Confirm that f of, f of negative 1 of x equals x. So basically what I have to do is do what they told me. f of means I'm going to start out with u, okay? Uh, I'm going to start out with, so f inverse of x. I'm going to write this out, but instead of x, I'm going to put a big parentheses, big parentheses minus 6, okay? And instead of x, I'm going to type in inverse. So I got x plus 6 over x. So distributed property, not over x, over 4, over 4, over 4, over 4. That would change a whole lot. That would change a whole lot because I don't need the distributed property at all for that. If I had that case, I could just go like this. So that's going to equal x plus 6 minus 6, which crosses out to x, which is what I'm supposed to get. Confirmed. Uh, find g inverse of f of 3. Well, let's find out what f of 3 is. f of 3 is 4 times 3 minus 6, which is 12, minus 6, which is 6. So f of 3 is 6. So g inverse of 6 is going to have me take this guy oh, and plug it in. Okay, so positive or negative square root of 6 minus 1 over 2 is just going to be the positive or negative square root of 5 over 2. So yeah, I'm going to have, there's not much I could do there. There's not much number, numerage I can do. So yeah, that's my guy. Not pleasant. But, you know, I did the math, and that's kind of the purpose of this whole thing. Take a look at the residual plots. I'm looking. I'm looking here. Which plot demonstrates an appropriate linear model? Well, what we said at the very beginning is if there appears to be no obvious pattern along this line, that that would make it a linear model. So you're a linear model. Well, about you? Well, you look to have this quadratic-looking behavior, which means you're not. So you're linear, you're not. The end. Now we're going to deal with our uh, calculator stuff. Okay, so lots of, not split screens, but I'm going to cut away and come back. Let's try to understand each problem before I do a whole bunch of things. Suppose you're considering investing in a cryptocurrency known as CryptoCoin. It's like a teacher made this up. You want to model the growth of your investment over time. You record the value of your investment at different time intervals and create the following table of values. Find the equation that models the growth of your investment in crypto coins. So what I have is I have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 in time and months. And my investment goes from 2000 to 2300 to a little bit more extra to a little bit more extra. So it doesn't look linear. So find the equation that models the growth of your investment. Well, first things first, this isn't linear. So since it is an investment and investments tend to grow exponentially, I'm going to use exponential regression for this guy. Take it away. All right. So we are doing a little bit of exponential regression. So let's just fire it up. Stat, edit, 
Zero, one, two, three, four, no typos, please. Then we've got 2,000. Then we've got 2,300. Then we've got 2,600. Notice, hundred, uh, notice that they're increasing and increasing a little bit more every single time. That's what makes it exponential. So it'll be, uh, yeah, yeah. I thought I made a typo there, but I didn't. All right. So this is what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to quit out of this. I'm going to hit stat. I'm going to hit calc. And I'm going to go to exponential regression, which I believe is zero. There it is. I'm going to hit enter. Okay. I'm going to store my regression equation in Y sub one so I can use it to answer part B. So I'm going to hit VARS, go to Y VARS, function, enter, and then once you calculate, you get your equation. So there's my equation right there. Y equals uh, 1998.974, uh, I guess we'll round it to. And that'll be multiplied to 1.151 to the X. All right, so the equation that I got was y equals 1998, the year of my birth, uh, 0.974 times 1.151 to the x exponential growth. So that's the exponential. Definitely not linear, definitely exponential. Use the equation from part A to predict the value of your investment after five months. So I'm going to use that equation. I'm going to be a little cute about it, okay, and I'm going to plug in five. So now when I want to use part A to find part B and uh, predict what happens after month five, since I stored this into Y equals, I can go to Y equals, there it is, hit graph, there it is. I'm probably not going to see anything. So why don't I do this just so I can see this is an unnecessary step. But if I second stat plot and turn my plots on, right, I will be able to see the points that I use. So if I do that, and go to zoom stat, zoom stat, I can see my points along with a line that goes through it, the curve that goes through it. Is this a bit too much? Maybe, because what I need to do now is find the value as y equals five. Uh, so second calc, although five might not be on here. Let me check my window. Oh no, let me check my x max to five. Yeah, I probably shouldn't have done that. Let's make it 5.5. Second trace takes me to value, value. Now I can type in five, hit enter, and I get that number right there, 4,033.795. What are we talking about, money here? So let's round this to the nearest cent because that would only make sense. <laughs> cents, $4,033.80. And so what I get is 4,000. $33.80. So this crypto coin, I started out with 2000 and five months later, I made over 2000 bucks. Wow. If there's anything I learned from this problem, it's that you can't go wrong with cryptocurrency. Hopefully you're not watching this in the near future and everything is falling apart. A company is in examining the growth of its user base over time using that function below. Let P of X, P of T be the number of users in T equals uh, days. So uh, users, find the initial number of users when T equals zero. I don't need a calculator, but I'm going to use a calculator. Just take a look. All right, so let's type this in. Y equals, we're just going to type it in right away. 1,000 parentheses, two point, all those numbers. So it looks like a very familiar number, but I'm going to pretend that I don't know what number that is. To the 0 0.1, that's just a regular one, 0 0.1, instead of T, we're going to use X. This is an exponential function graph. We're not going to see anything. So if I want to change my window, since we kind of start out at the 1000 territory, if I change my window to like an X min of around 1000, uh, no, 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 yeah. Maybe change you to, I don't know, 2,000. See what happens. See what happens. Who knows? Graph. 
uh, find the initial number of users when t equals zero. So why don't I just hit second trace, go to value and type in when t or x equals zero and I get a thousand. Well, that makes a ton of sense. Because if I were to type in zero into this initial equation right here, that eliminates all of you turning you into one and a thousand times one is a thousand. So A is pretty simple. So common sense would say, look, if I just plug in zero, uh, you would be 1.0.1 times zero. So this guy to the zero power just goes away. So yeah, it is a thousand. Uh, no calculator needed, but I used a calculator anyway. Uh, I'm going to come up with an exponential function. I have an exponential function. I'm going to use that guy to plug in five, see what happens. B, use the given exponential function to estimate the number of users after five days. Well, T is five in this case, so X is five. So I'm going to hit second calc value. I'm going to plug in five, enter, and it's going to be 1,648.7, blah, 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 blah. What are we talking about? Users, the number of users. So I'm going to round this off to the nearest user because I couldn't have decimal users. So I'm going to make it 1,649 because it rounds up. Okay. If you said 1,648, I don't think you get punished on AP land, but you know, I'm rounding it up because that's where you're supposed to round. 1,649 users. Again, I'm rounding it to the nearest user because you don't want to have a decimal user. That would be illegal. Somebody was chopped in half. Okay. The company collected data and found that at three days, you had 1,500 users. Verify if that data aligns with the exponential model. If not, explain why. The company collected data and found out that at three days, they had 1,500 users. Verify if the data aligns with the exponential model. If not, explain why. All right, so let's plug in three. Trace value three. And no. So I'm going to say no because it's more like 1,350-ish. So that data that this company collected does not verify. That's a big fat N-O on that one. Well, it did because we ended up with 1350 or something along those lines. So this is a big fat no. And it's a big fat no because we were expecting, according to our exponential model, 1350-ish. But instead, this guy says 1500. That's off. And if, you know, if it, you were off by 15, that's one thing. But when you're dealing with 1500 users and you're off by roughly 10%, that ain't good, so we're going to say a big fat no here. Why? Well, because we were off by about 10%, and that's unacceptable. Unacceptable. All right. Moving my face. Another calculator problem. Marketing team is analyzing two competing models to predict sales. So we have ourselves a linear equation. We have ourselves a quadratic equation. Determine the number of units sold according to model A and model B when X equals 50, whatever X means. So not a lot of information for this guy. It looks like we're just plugging and chugging. So I have two models here. Sounds like me in college. I'm going to type in both of them. I'm going to type out this linear looking guy, 200x minus 5,000. That's going to be f of x. So I will just remember that y sub 1 is f of x. And model B, g sub x is going to be y sub 2. So that's 0.03x squared, a quadratic, plus 500. All right. Determine the number of units sold according to model A and model B when X equals zero. So I'm going to do this. I'm rather than typing out, you know, second trace, go to value. I'm going to go to my table. So second table, and I'm going to hit down for a few seconds until I hit 50 right there. So at 50, I get a whopping 5,000 for Y sub one. So that tells us that model A is going to be five thousand and model b which is going to be y sub 2 is going to be 575 on the dot so model a gives us 5000 no calculator needed for that i could have just done that uh that's not 5000 if i plug in 50 it is 5000 stupid and then b ended up being, what was it, 575. All right, which model predicts higher sales at X equals 100? Why? 
So we're still here. Which model predicts higher sales at Y equals a hundo? Let's scroll down. Let's scroll down. Let's keep scrolling down. Uh, it looks like Y sub one, which is model A, by quite a bit. And it asks us why. Well, because that one's bigger. I, I don't know. So let's just say that. Well, when I plug in each, uh, the answer was A, because the number was bigger. Simple. Compare the slopes of the functions at X equals 25. What does this reveal about the growth? Be careful. This is not plug in 25. This is examine the slopes. So you are a linear equation. You are quadratic. Okay. You look like that. You look like that. I have to see what happens at 25 for both of these and compared to two, the two. And since that's gross, I have a feeling that I'm going to do a lot of calculator manipulation and stuff like that. Have fun. Compare the slopes of the functions at x equals 25. Well, if I hit graph, I get to see both, but I really don't see much of anything. So let me zoom out. Zoom 3, enter. There's 1. Zoom 3, enter. Hmm. So I'm not really seeing a good picture here. Not at all. So this is what I want to do. What I want to do is I want to kind of get a really good view of each of these. So I'm going to hit window. I'm going to change. I care about what happens at 25 and I want to compare the slopes. Okay. So uh, let's make this number 20. Let's make you 30. Let's see what picture we get there. There's the one. I still don't even see the other. So what is blue? Blue is the first one. So I'm yet to see the second one. So let's change my window to, I don't know, negative 500 to regular 500. There's one. And I still don't see the other. All right. Well, this is what I do know. Uh, maybe I can't do much, but it looks like at 25 here, uh, the slope is just like a regular positive linear thing. I mean, that, that makes sense. I mean, at 25, it's linear. So I'm going to keep that and say, yeah, all right. So model A is linear. I'm writing it down. Model B is quadratic. So I'm not sure why I'm having such a hard time viewing model B, except for the fact that it's going to be insanely steep at 25. Okay, so if I zoom out and make my Y max like much bigger, like let's put it at 5,000 and see what happens. The graph. Ah, mm, it's not insanely steep. I was wrong. Model B it's, is must let is really not steep at all. So I was way off in my prediction there. Uh, so what does that reveal about the growth sales of each model? Well, that tells me at that moment right there at 25, that A is growing at a much higher rate than B at that very moment. So I'll say that. So the linear model was much steeper, like significantly steeper at that moment right there. So what that means is model A has a higher, what are we talking about? Sales, a higher sales rate at 25, whatever 25 means. Okay. But since the, uh, since the slope at 25, which is much, which is much steeper than the slope at, uh, this guy in the quadratic, we could say that the rate is steeper, which means the rate is larger. Last one. Ah, uh, yes. The biggest rivalry of them all, Captain America and Jesus. They're having a debate about this data over here. Captain America thinks the data is linear. Uh, and he thinks the equation y equals negative 2 fifths x plus 2.3 should do the job. Draw a residual plot to show that Captain America is wrong. Uh, yes, the old battle between Captain America and Jesus. Let's put in our values. Stat edit. 
we've got one zero through seven, so no typos necessary for that one right there. And then we just type it in, 4.11, uh, 1.87. And what we're supposed to do with this guy is draw a residual plot using the equation that we have. So I'm going to continue typing this out. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I was hoping to pause it and I, I didn't. You got a picture of sound of me sneezing. Sneezing so hard I typed out the wrong thing. Is the season. All right, I'm going to leave that in there. Okay, so uh, those are my guys. So this is what I want to do. I want to see them, okay? Because if I have like a, a residual plot thing going on, I want to see them. So how do I see them? Well, let's get out of here. Let's go to stat plot and let's hit enter and turn our plot on. Okay, so now I should be able to see those dots right there. Now, I don't care about all this stuff. So how can I just zoom in on what's important? Zoom, stat is zoom nine. There you go. Now, I'm also given this equation right here that I want to graph. Okay, y equals negative two, uh, that's a minus sign, negative two divided by five, x plus 2.3. Yeah, see, now, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Uh, that's definitely not, not at all linear. And if you're looking at the residual plot, I'm going to draw a residual plot based off of what I see. And the residual plot is going to have like a dot way above and then a dot on and then below and then below and then below and then there and then above and then above. And it clearly shows a pattern that appears to be quadratic ish, or maybe it's exponential. I don't know, but regardless, the residual plot, when I show it is going to show a pattern and that's no good. So since Captain America thinks the data is linear, uh, he's wrong because since this shows, and keep in mind, a residual plot is basically this guy, but sideways, okay? Since you have above, on, below, 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 uh, on, above, above, it shows the pattern, which means linear is not an appropriate model. Sorry, Captain America, but just like always, Jesus is right. So give or take, the residual plot is going to look something like this. I mean, obviously it's not exact, uh, but you know, it ended up looking something like that, which as you can see, that is a pattern, a quadratic -y looking pattern. So is this linear? Is this data linear? No, no, this ain't linear. So I'm sorry, Captain America, you might be strong and you might have America's rear end, but not, not in this one. Not in this one. I censored myself. Jesus says the data is exponential. Use exponential to regression to create an equation and compare it to the points on a calculator. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do some stat plot stuff. For me, it's not good enough to just come up with the equation. I want to see the points and see the equation to see how accurate Jesus is. Now, Jesus says the data is exponential. So I'm going to use the exponential regression to create an equation and compare it to the points on the calculator. So I didn't do that yet. So if I quit out of here and I go to stat, edit, no, calc, and I go down to exponential regression, which is zero, I'll be able to get my equation. But I, what I also want to do is I want to store it into y equals. So enter, enter, enter. I'm going to hit vars. I'm going to hit window. I'm going to hit, uh, no, nope, vars. I'm going to hit y vars. I'm going to hit function. I'm going to hit y sub one. I'm going to calculate it. And that's the equation that I get. So the equation that I get is y equals 3.389 times 0 0.526 uh, to the x. 
Now let's graph that. See, I stored it in my y equals, so there it is. Now it covered the old linear equation, but that's okay. I don't need that linear equation anymore. So that to me, is it perfect? No, but does this appear to be an exponential model? It sure does because it covers things pretty nicely. So there you have it, exponential. Just like always, Jesus is right. Well, as always, Jesus is spot on. I mean, it wasn't exact, but it was pretty close. And the picture that you saw, I mean, the data lined up quite nicely with this equation that we're writing out right here. So that's the second four, the second chunk of unit two in AP pre-calculus, okay? Residual plots, composites, inverses, uh, lots, lots going on here. So, uh, yeah. And soon after this, uh, there will be a video coming out. If, you know, if you're already in the future, the video is out that has to do with a progress check part A of unit two, which covers the first eight sections of chapter two. But this is only five through eight to give you a nice, you know, just in case your teacher gives you a quiz or something like that. This covers all of that. All right. So there you have it. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Give me some of that sweet, sweet YouTube money. I need it. I need it. Thanks. Bye. What up, what up? Today in AP Precalculus land, we're going to talk about sections 2.9 to 2.12. Lots of logs. It's like uh, we're talking about maybe building a tree in a, a cabin, a log cabin. And blew it. Uh, exponential stuff too. Let's talk about the logarithmic rules. There's a bunch of them that we have to know. So if I give you something like, I don't know, log base b of y equals x. This is the most basic log rule. We could write this out as b to the x equals y. Okay, this is how you shift from logarithmic form to exponential form. So if I give you a problem, there, there's two types of problems that you could see as far as basic types of problems. If I give you a problem that says uh, log base 2 of 8 equals three. And I'm like, please rewrite that into exponential form. What I do is I would say, all right, well, you would be my B and you would be my Y and you would be my X. And so I'll write that out as B to the X, two to the third equals Y, which is my eight. That's way number one of doing a problem like this. Way number two is I give you exponential form. So something like 10 to the X equals 519. Okay, now this is a calculator type of problem, but you get the idea. Uh, we would write that out as, well, let's call you B and let's call you X and let's call you Y. We would write that out as log base 10 of 519 equals X. Then we would use our calculator to solve that. And you might be thinking, how would we use our calculator to solve that? That's gross. Log base 10 is the same as log. Same exact thing. So the regular looking log in your calculator is also known as log base 10. Now this is the primary log rule. Okay, that we have. This is you switching from exponential to logarithmic and vice versa. There's other log rules that we need to know and be aware of. Log rule number one, if I have the same base, so log base B of M plus log base B of N, if I have the same exact base for a log and I'm adding logs, multiply the insides. Okay, so log base B of MN. Okay, similarly, Rule number two is if I were to use the same exact guy but subtract, common sense would tell us that, well, adding logs of the same base was multiplying the inside. So maybe subtracting logs of the same base is dividing the insides. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So log base 10 of M over N. Rule number three is if I were to throw like a coefficient in front of a log. 
So log base B of M, and there's an A living in front. You can write that out as log base B of M to the A power. Okay, so these are our main log rules. So we're going to have to do, when we solve these guys, we're going to have to do a lot of combining, maybe expanding, maybe doing some other stuff, but you'll see. That's kind of the point of these videos. Okay, don't want to bury the lead. Now, graphing a logarithmic function is weird. All right, so this is how I handle this. Logarithmic functions traditionally look like this. Okay, so some, something like that. You start from down here, you end up up here. Traditionally, logs can't have negative inputs. In fact, they definitely can't have negative inputs. There's no such thing. Now, this is what I would do. Okay, let's say I asked you to graph something like y equals log base 3 of x. Okay, if you go to your calculator and you look for log base 3, you're not going to find it. Now, if you're allowed to use your calculator, there's something that you could use called the change of base formula, which is probably something I should have put in the last slide. I totally forgot. I'll go back. Uh, but you, you, can't, you can't just type that straight in your calculator. You can't go to y equals and type that straight in your calculator. Also, what if you're not allowed to use your calculator? This is what I would do. Okay. I would rewrite this as, uh, sorry, multitasking. I would rewrite this as what we saw in the previous uh, slide. As x equals 3 to the y power. Now, if this was something like y equals 3 to the x power, you would be like, oh, all right, well, let's just pick a bunch of x values and get a bunch of y values, and we're done. But it's backwards. Well, this is what I'll do then. I'll handle it backwards. Instead of picking a bunch of x values to try to get a y, I'm going to pick a bunch of y values to try to get an x. So I'll let y equal negative 2 and negative 1, 0, 1, 2, three. And then what I'll do is I'll plug in that y, get an x value. And then when I graph, I graph as normal. Okay, so I'm going to select negative two. So three to the negative two is the same as one over three squared. So my x value is one ninth, and that gets me negative two. Uh, if I do negative 1, that's 3 to the negative 1, which is the same as 1 over 3. Don't need to do any math there. If I plug in 0 for y, I get x equals 3 to the 0, which is 1. So my x value is 1. If I plug in 1, I get x equals 3 to the first, which is just 3. If I plug in 2, I get x equals 3 squared, which is 9. And if I plug in 3, I get x equals uh, 3 cubed, which is 27. Kind of a big number, so I'm not going to really deal with that. Uh, I chose y values like this. Maybe I should shorten that up a little bit. Um, no negative x values, never negative x values. You're not allowed to have a negative domain for logs. It's just a rule. And I have to make sure I go out to 9 so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Let's add 10 for good measure. And let's graph these points. Okay. When x is 1 ninth, which is almost 0, I get negative 2. When x is 1 third, uh, I get negative 1, so something like that. When x is 1, I get 0, so something like that. When x is 3, I get 1, so something like that. When x is when x is nine, I get two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then of course I'm not going to graph 27, 3. But the picture that we get here is exactly like what I said we'd get. What we get is this curve that will never hit the y-axis. Ignore my terrible drawing. <laughs> oh my gosh. Can I scooch this down to make it better? Oh no, not perfect at all. Let's try it one more time. Let's try it one more time. Let's try it one more time. I'm so bad at these. All right. So let's just sketch it this way. Sketch it like Skechers. Try to flatten it out. Oh, man. Perfect. Perfect. Look at that. 
So you'll never have a negative uh, X value because you're not allowed to. You're not allowed to have negative X values. You're not allowed to have negative X values. So by the way, this has to do with a lot of inverse stuff, which we will probably see. You know, if if you were to try to remember what a uh, exponential uh, function looks like, it looks something like this. So this is just the Y equals X mirror image of it. Now, one of the things that I didn't write on the last uh, page, if if you did have a um, calculator and you were allowed to use a calculator, you could use the change of base formula. Now, the change of base formula says if you have log base B of M, you can write this out as any log you want, but I'll just use regular log for log base 10. Log base 10 of M over log base B. So if you had a graphing calculator and you were allowed to use the graphing calculator to graph that, you would run to the Y equals thing and type out, uh, maybe use parentheses because I'm paranoid, log of X divided by log of three. And that'll do it for you. It'll look like that. Just without gross looking lines because that's what I do, unfortunately gross looking lines. Mm, oh yeah, E. What is E? E is a number 2.718, blah, 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 blah. The natural log ln of x is the exact same thing as log base E of x. So it's important to understand that ln follows the same exact rules as log. So if I were to just give you some random problem like this, ln of 3 plus 2 ln of x minus ln of 4y. And if I was like, simplify that, you would say, oh, well, lns follow the same exact rules as logs. So I would have you guys add, which means I'm up oh, first, let's move you here. So this becomes ln of 3 plus ln of x squared. Now we can combine those through multiplication. So you become ln of 3x squared. And then we have this minus ln of 4y that's just hanging out there. Since you're subtracting them, why don't I divide the insides? Yeah. Just like that. When I move, you move just like that. Nicki Minaj. Just kidding, it's super crazy. Uh, inverse functions of logs This kind of, I brought this up accidentally, but you know, a, a, if I were to give you that log base three of X, Y equals that, right? We know what that looks like as gross as it looks. We know it's going to look something like this. Okay. It's going to look something like that. When you have an inverse, Okay, and I ask you to find the inverse of this guy. The way you find an inverse of anything is you first swap the X and the Y. So X equals log base three of Y. Now, you might be thinking, I have to solve for Y, but Y now lives on the inside of this log. How do I do that? In order to make a log base whatever disappear, log base, disappear, you take the base to the of both sides. Now, I know that sounds weird, but there's another rule that says three, let's not use three, let's use B. I'm going to use three in this case, but let's just have a general rule. B to the log base B of X cancels these guys out and leaves you with just X. Similarly, similarly, log base b of b to the x, can't spin that, b to the x cancels out the b's yet again. So if I want to get rid of the log and I want to get y all by itself, what I would do is I would take three to the of both sides. Sloppy, yes. Legal, yes. Three to the of both sides cancels that guy out and leads me with three to the X equals Y. Flip flop to make it look better and make that the inverse. And then what we have 
is an exponential function. And I know exponential functions look like this. And if you're wondering, oh, wait a minute, I know that is a reflection over the y e equals x axis. That is a reflection over the y equals x axis. Oh, a phrase that's very difficult for me to say, but I did it. I did it. All right. Let's do some problems, shall we? All right, I need a location change. They're mowing the lawn and, and blowing leaves outside my room, and it's just too much noise. I can't handle it. So here we are. No calculator. Don't need one. First things first, rewrite, rewrite 5 to the second power equals 25 as a logarithm. All right, well, the rule was log base b of y equals x can be rewritten as b to the x equals y. So you would be my b, you would be my x, and you would be my y. And now I'm going from right to left and saying log base 5 of x, which was 25 equals 2. Not bad. Not bad at all. All right. Uh, I'm going to do the same thing here. Or am I? Now I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm going to rewrite that as that. So you would be like my B and you would be like my X and you would be like my Y. And so I'm going to write this as 5 to the 3X plus 4 uh, equals 0 0.04, which is the same as 1 over 25. I mislabeled these, by the way. Meow, meow. Maup, maup. No one will ever know the difference. All right. So now that I have that, you might be looking at this and saying, well, how in the world, sir, are you going to do this? I can rewrite 1 over 25 to have a base of 5. Remember, there's a rule that says if you have something that looks like this, just set them equal to each other and x is going to equal 3. Well, I'm not going to have x is equal to 3, but if I can write this out as uh, 1 over 25, if I can write that out as 1 over 5 squared, right, and then move that up and make that a negative exponent, I have that. Now I have the same exact base for both of them, and I can set the exponents equal to each other like so. So I have 3x plus 4 equals negative 2. Subtract 4, subtract 4, cross you out. 3x equals negative 6. Divide by 3, divide by 3, cross you out. x equals negative 2 x equals negative 2. Now, what I'm going to do for C, I could have done for B, and there would have been no problem with it. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, look, I can rewrite this as an exponent, but one of the things that the guy said in the previous slide is if I take x to the of both sides, uh, it makes the x's go away. So now I have was I crazy for doing this problem? No, I'm not. I am crazy. Holy cow. Now I have uh, that crosses out. I have 2 equals x to the 16th. I think when I originally made this problem, I wanted something else to happen. And uh, so that didn't work out that way at all. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the 16th root of both sides. But still, something happens here that needs to happen. Again, I wanted that to be x squared. I just miswrote it, but that's all right. When you take the x root or the 16th root or an even root, you have a plus or minus thing going on. Okay, so you're going to have x equals the positive or negative 16th root of 2, whatever that is. The issue is, is I can't have a negative base. I can't. So what I'm going to do is I'm only going to care about the uh, positive part, x equals the positive 16th root of 2. So stupid typo by me. Probably the first of many. All right. 
Now we have uh, two logs of the same base added to each other, which means I know I can just multiply the insides. Log base 4 of 3x equals 2. I could take that, rewrite that as that, or I could just take 4 to the of both sides. So I'm going to do 4 to the of both sides. That crosses out. That gets me 3x alone equals 4 squared, which is 16. Divide both sides by 3. Divide both sides by 3. And x equals whatever 16 over 3 is. 5 and a third. 5.3 repeating. Okay. Okay. Rewrite e to the x as a log, e to the second equals x as a logarithm. All right, so if log base e of x is the same as ln, and I have ln of x equals y, I can rewrite that out as log base e to the y equals x. So e to the y equals x can be written out as ln of x equals 2. Solve ln of x squared equals 4. Again, I can do the whole e to the of both sides, which I will do, and the same rules apply. Or if I take e to the ln of x squared, I get x squared. So let me write that out here. That's going to equal e to the fourth. Now this is what I was hoping would happen in part c of the previous problem when I created it, but I just had a mistype. I just went with it anyway. In order to get x all by itself, you square root. And whenever you square root both sides, you have to attach a positive or negative. So x squared is going to equal positive or negative uh, e squared. X, regular X, not X squared. Regular X. I don't know why I did that. Regular X. Now you might be thinking, this is bad, sir. This is bad news because of the way you, you, you said you're not allowed to have negative. If I were to take this guy and plug it in and plug in E squared, squared, that's fine. If I were to plug in negative e squared, squared, I'd still get positive. And you're not allowed to have negative lns, but this would still work. However, if I gave you the problem as this, okay, I cannot have a negative in here. But since I gave you the problem as that, I'm allowed to plug it in. So keep in mind, what you really want to do with some of these is if you get negative answers, plug them into the original problem and see if it would still work. In this case, it would still work. If I gave you this guy, this guy can be written as that. However, I'm not allowed to plug in a negative into X. It wouldn't work. So, but since I gave you the problem to start out like that, it still works. So I know tricky, very tricky, but that's, that's uh, logs for you. Solve for x in the equation ln of 2x equal, uh, plus 3 equals 4 and express the solution in exponential form. Okay, why well, don't I just take e to the of both sides again. That way these guys cross out. I get 2x plus 3 equals e to the fourth. Subtract 3, subtract 3, cross you out. 2x equals e to the fourth minus 3. Divide everything by 2, divide everything by 2, and x is going to equal e to the 4th minus 3 over 2. Boom, 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 boom. No calculator. No calculator needed. So being this problem and seeing the last slide, not fun. Not fun at all, but you know, you got through it. And what's important to realize is you have to plug stuff in at the end to make sure it works. And if I plugged in negative e squared to that guy, you would have negative e squared in parentheses squared, which makes it all positive anyway, so it's okay. But again, if I gave you this problem, if I made it look like this first and I tried to plug in negative e squared, it wouldn't work. So it all has to do with the original problem, whatever it is that you're given. 
Oh, sorry, Mr. Graf. Let me move my face. <sighs> Graf f of x equals 2 to the x. So I'm going to make myself an xy table. All right. I already know that this is going to look something like this, but I want to be sure. Uh, I'll choose negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. If I plug in negative 1, that's 2 to the negative 1, which is a half. If I were to plug in 0, I get 1. If I were to plug in 1, I get 2. If I were to plug in 2, I get 2 squared, which is 4. And if I were to plug in 3, I get 2 to the third, which is 8. Okay? So let's make sure that... Uh, I go out this far. I have a feeling that I'm supposed to do a log. Oh yeah. All right. So negative one was a half. Boom. Uh, zero was one. Boom. One was two. Boom. Uh, two was four, right? Boom. And then three was eight somewhere up here. And then we get that nice exponential. It's flat right here and then starts to curve up and really curl up. Okay. Determine the domain and range of f of x. Well, the domain is everything. The domain is going to be everything because I'm allowed to plug in whatever I want into an exponential function whatever I want, okay? Uh, the range is only the x values. So I'm going to say zero, not a bracket, to infinity, okay? As you can see, this will never go below the x-axis. This will always flatten out. And that makes sense. No matter what negative number, if I were to plug in negative infinity, it would be one over two to the infinity, which is basically zero, but not quite zero. Remember limits? So that's why that doesn't work. Now, find the inverse of f. So that's fine. I will call you y just so I can swap it out. So I have 2 to the x. Step number one is you swap your x and your y. So I have 2 to the y now. In order to find uh, or get y all by itself, I have to log base 2 both sides. So that gives me log base 2 of x is going to equal y. Or you could just rewrite it in exponential form, whatever works. Let's flip this over, y equals uh, log base 2 of x. And let's call it f inverse instead of y. So f inverse is going to be log base 2 of x. Now I know what's going to happen because of what I did a couple slides ago. But I'm just going to make sure that uh, I do it right. Now, I have this guy. I have it right there. Okay, this is the same as that flipped. All right, so what I'm going to do is my X and my Y values are going to flip flop as well. So you become one half, negative one. You become one, zero. You become two, one. You become four, two and you become 8, 3. So 1 half is negative 1. Boop. And 1 is 0. Boop. And 2 is 1. 2 is 1. Boop. And 4 is 2. Boop. And uh, 8 is 3. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 is 3. And then And then what you could see is you could see that this, yeah, is a mirror image over the axis uh, y equals x. Okay? So, yeah, kind of nice how everything just works out, isn't it? Kind of nice. Moving along, and we're moving. And we're moving. Oh.
didn't I just do this? Gra I did. <laughs> okay. Graph the function y equals log base 2 of x and determine its domain. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write this out in its exponential form so I can graph it. All right. So 2 to the y equals x. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug in a bunch of y values like negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, and that'll give me some x values. So if I plug in negative 1, I get 2 to the negative 1, which is a half, so x equals a half. If I plug in 0, I get 2 to the 0, which is 1. If I plug in 1, I get 2 to the first, which is 2. If I plug in 2, I get 2 squared, which is 4. And if I plug in um, 3, I get 2 to the eighth, 2 to the 3, which is 8. And so, yeah, so you get this guy again. So I'm not sure why I decided that I'd do it again. Wasn't really thinking, I guess, when I made these. That's all right. More, more time is more money in YouTube land. Solve the equation uh, log base 3 of 2x plus 1 equals 2. Is this a calculator section? No. So I am going to take 3 to the of both sides. That cancels out and gives me 2x plus 1 equals 3 squared, which is 9. Okay. Minus 1, minus 1. That gets me 2x equals 8. Divide by 2, divide by 2, cross u out, x equals 4. Am I allowed to plug in 4 into the original problem? Yes, because then I'll take the log of a positive number. It all works out. It all works out. Graph the function from part A and the solution from part B on the same set of axes identifying the points of intersection. All right, so if I were to do that, I guess it wants uh, x equals 4. So you would get something that looks like this. And so the point of intersection would be log base 2 of 4. And if I wanted to find out what y was, I could rewrite this as 2 to the y equals 4. I can rewrite 4 as a... Uh, uh, 2 squared. Y is 2. Look at that. Interesting. Interesting, 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 interesting. I'm glad I made that problem up. Actually, I used chat GPT for help on that one. Thank you, chat GPT. Thank you, AI. Allen Iverson, one of my favorite athletes of all time. Still no calculator. Oh, my gosh. All these problems without a calculator. Simplify the following ex expression. 2 log base 5x log base 5 3y minus log base 5 of z. First thing I have to do is deal with the exponent stuff. So now I have log base 5 of x squared plus log base 5 of 3y minus log base 5 of z. These two fellas are being added, so I'm going to multiply the insides. Log base 5 of 3x squared y minus log base 5 of z. Well, that, by golly, is subtracting, so I'm going to divide the insides. So just so I have plenty of space here, I'm going to end up with log base 5 of 3x squared y over z. Expand. Okay. Uh, what Now, what I did to do this one is I did exponents first, then I added, then I subtracted. 
okay, uh, I'm going to go in reverse. I'm going to do the stuff that would subtract first and then the stuff that would add and then the stuff that would uh, exponent. So let's split this up using the division part first. So ln, remember ln and log follow the same rule. So ln 3x squared y cubed minus ln of z squared. Now I'm multiplying one, two, three things inside that parentheses, which means in order for me to get to that point, I must have added those three things to begin with. So you become ln of three plus ln of x squared plus ln of y cubed. Over here, I still have minus ln of z squared. You're fine. These guys have exponents, so let's one, two, three, bring them out. Two plus two ln of x plus three ln of y minus two ln of z. Mm hmm. Okay, let f of x equals log base 4 of x. I can handle that. Find g of x, which is f of 4 plus 2 f of w, so some random w, minus 8. Okay, uh, f of 4 means, let's go off to the side, f of 4 has me plugging in 4 to that original guy. So log base 4 of 4, fun fact, is equal to 1. So f of 4 is 1. So you're now 1. So g of x is going to be 1 plus 2 f of w, which is going to be log base 4 of w, all right. Minus 8. Which simplifies out to, let's put this up here, log base 4 of w squared minus 7. Let's wrap that into parentheses so I know that you're not a part of log base 4. What a weird problem I made up. Still no calculator, my goodness, my goodness. Given the function f of x equals 3e to the 2x minus 1, find the inverse function. Okay, so let's do this. Let's make this y equals 3e to the 2x minus 1. I have to swap x and y, so x equals 3e to the ln, no, to the 2y minus 1. I have to divide both sides by 3. So x over 3 equals regular e with a space on purpose to uh, y minus 1, ln both sides. It's supposed to be a parentheses. Things are a little laggy today. Ln of that cancels that out. So now I have ln of x over 3 equals 2y minus 1. So let's add 1 ln of x over 3 plus 1 equals 2y divide both sides by 2 and that can be written out as 1 half ln 
to the or of x over 3 plus 1 half equals y. Now, why did I do that? Why didn't I leave that as over 2? Well, because that over 2 implies that ln has a coefficient, which means I'm going to make you an exponent. Now, an exponent of 1 half, well, that is a square root. So now you become ln of the square root of x over 3, right, plus 1 half equals y, or I'll just call it f inverse of x. That's awful. I just plain awful. Determine the domain and the range of the original function. Well, what am I allowed to plug in? Again, I'm allowed to plug in any number I want uh, as long as it's not negative. So that's not going to change anytime soon. I mean, of course, that would also make sense. I can't plug in a negative inside of square root 2. So I, my domain is not going to change. Okay. So uh, I have a domain of um, negative infinity to positive infinity. And my range is going to be, oh, I'm adding a half. So since my range is a half, I'm going to bump it up one just a little bit. Okay, so uh, this is a ln. So my range is going to be uh, one half Oh no, this is an ln function, which means it looks like this. So I have to take it back. I take it back. I take it back. I even said, said this earlier. Here. Determine the domain and the range of the original function. Well, here's the original function, which is exponential. Okay, exponential. <clears throat> So what I have is, since it's exponential, it's squeezed a little bit. That's what that 3 means. That 2x minus 1 shifts it right a half. Yes, shifts it right a half, which is not going to change much. It's still going to give me a domain. It's still going to give me an image that looks like this. Maybe I should have moved it over, but we get the idea. The domain of this guy, the original function, is I get to plug in whatever I want. You can't stop me. The range is I'm still going to flatten out at zero and go all the way to infinity. So, you know, because I'm not adding or doing anything on the outside. So my range is going to be zero, flattening out, and infinity. Now, this guy is having me find the domain and range of that guy. Well, aren't they just flip-flopped? Because aren't I going to get something that looks like this, give or take, which means the domain is I'm not allowed to have any negatives. Okay, when I have an ln, I'm not allowed to plug in any negatives. And look at that, I have a square root, so I'm definitely not allowed to plug in negatives. And my range is going to be, you know, as many as I want. Sketch a graph of each, done so. That's supposed to be a check mark, but since things are laggy a little bit today, since my little Chromebook is lagging, it doesn't look as good. Oh man, will this affect how many views I get? No. If you made it this far, you're committed. You're committed to the bit. <sighs> Thank you, Lord Jesus. There's the calculator. So let's just jump right into it. Uh, in order to solve this, uh, I need to make sure that I have it in a format that makes it graphable into a calculator or something like that. Uh, I can't just like plug in X values and see what happens. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this in log form, log base 10 of 56 equals X. Log base 10 is the log in your calculator. So I'm going to step to the side and let your calculator do all the work. 
Okay, now that we've got this in log formation, remember log base 10 and log are just the same exact guy. So all we have to do for this guy is log 56, and then round the three decimal places, 1.748, and we're done. So Mr. Calculator says that X is going to equal 1.948 cubed. Thank you, Mr. Calculator. Okay. Uh, let's rewrite that as a log because, again, I, I really don't want to plug in a bunch of X values and see which guy matches up. So if I write this as a log, I have log base 3 of 143 equals 4X. Okay, again, take log base 3 of both sides. That'll get you that. You'll be all right. Uh, now, I can't plug that in my calculator, but you know what I could use? The change of base formula. So what I'm going to do is the change of base formula says log base B of stuff is the same thing as log of stuff over log of base. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug that guy into my calculator and see what my calculator gives me. Then I'm going to divide it by 4, and I'll get my answer. All right, so now we're at the part of the problem where we, we could just use the change of base formula. So we could do log of 143, close that parentheses, divided by log of regular 3. If I could just hit the button, there you go. Now that's going to get us a terrible number. All right, so without having to go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, what we'll do after that is since the next step would be divide both sides by 4, let's just do that right now. Divide both sides by 4, and you've got 1.129 rounded to three decimal places, so that's going to be our answer, 1.129. All right, so again, I plugged that person into my calculator, got some gross number, divided it by 4, and when I divided everything by 4, x equals 1.129. Okay. Let's do some combinations. Let's move that guy up there first. So I have log base 10, that's nice, uh, 7x, 7x plus log base 10, x squared, equals 1. Since I'm adding two log base 10s, I can combine those through multiplication, so multiply the inside. 7x times x squared is 7x uh, cubed, so log base 10 of 7x cubed is going to equal 1. Since that's log base 10, I can 10 to the both sides, that crosses out, and now I have 7x to the third equals 10 to the first, which is 10. I'm going to divide both sides by 7. And now it's a matter of cube rooting whatever 10 over 7 is. I don't know what the cube root of 10 over 7 is. Go ahead, find out. All right, so for this guy, really the only calculator part that we need to do was take the cube root of 10 sevenths, which, you know, we should all know, but for some reason, I'm just going to show it to you anyway. So there's the cube root. You hit math four and 10 divided by seven, all in the same root, and you get 1.126, very similar to the answer that we had before, but has nothing to do with each other. 1.126. X equals 1.126, baby. Very similar looking answers. Very similar, close to each other. You know what? My lights just went out, but I like it. It's dark. It's creepy. Uh, so I'm going to keep it that way. Solve each. Okay. I have 2e to the x, so why don't I just rewrite that as e to the 2x because I can multiply that to there. e to the 2x equals 7. If I wrote that out in log form uh, or take the ln of both sides, I would get 2x equals ln of 7. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run to my calculator and find out what ln of 7 is and then divide it by 2. Okay, so the way I handled this one 
is I just divided both sides by two right off the bat. So now all I have to do is ln of seven over two, ln DeGeneres is seven over two, and I get one point, a lot, a lot of one point stuffs in this packet, but that's what I get when I create my own problems. 1.253, let's round that puppy up. All right, x equals 1.253 for that one. All right, I move my desk because no more leaf blowers. Uh, all right, B. Let's combine these guys right here. Uh, subtracting LNs means you divide the inside. So LN of 4X divided by 2 is just 2X. That equals LN of negative 1. Huh. LNs on both sides, huh? So let's E to the both sides. E to the, E to the. That cancels out and leaves me with 2x equals negative 1. I don't think I need a calculator for this guy. Divide both sides by 2. x equals negative 1 over 2. I did it. I did it right. <laughs> no. Whenever you see a negative answer for an LN problem, check your work. Because if you were to take negative one half and plug it into x here, you would get ln of negative two. And what's ln of a negative number? Impossible. And you should have seen that right off the bat, boys and girls. You can't do this. This one is a new solution. Can't do it. There's no answer. I'm sorry. There's no answer for that guy. So no calculator needed because it's impossible. Let's take a look at C. Uh, nothing's impossible with this one. This one seems pretty straightforward. First thing I want to do, though, is move that exponent up there. So now I have ln of 6x plus 5 equals uh, ln of 1 to the fourth power, which is just 1. Wait a minute. ln of 1? Log of 1? <gasps> That's just 0. Oh, yay. So you could turn that into that. Even if you didn't realize that and you like tried to combine with the ln of 6x, you'd still be all right. But now I have this. I'm going to subtract 5 from both sides. And I get ln of 6x equals negative 5. Okay, ln, I'm going to take the e to the of both sides. e to the of both sides. That crosses out and leaves me with 6x equals e to the negative fifth. So in my calculator, I'm going to do two steps. I'm going to find out what e to the negative fifth is, divide both sides by 6. That'll get me my guy. Okay, so we made it this far. Let's do e to the negative fifth first. So where's e? Second ln gives us e to the. So now all I have to do is type out negative fifth. Hit enter on that guy. Logically, the next step would be divide both sides by 6, so let's do that. And we get an awfully small number, 0 0.001 is going to be our guy. So x equals 0 0.001, a really small number, which makes sense because e to the negative fifth is the same thing as 1 over e to the fifth, really small number. Divide that by 6, much smaller number. So there you have it. Mm, fun, 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 fun. Be careful with B. B is very easy to screw up. So just don't screw it up, all right? Okay? Don't screw it up. Last slide. Pert. Uh, find the value of an account with a principal amount of 10,000 compounded continuously at a rate of 0.3% uh, for uh, 10 years. So this is the continuously compounded interest formula. I'm going to plug into my calculator 10,000, because that's my principal, times e to the. Now, it's very important when you use r, you're using r as a decimal. So 0.3% is 0 0.003. And I'm going to multiply that to 10 for 10 years. Wow, 10 years. My, I bet you I'm going to make so much money. After 10 years, I guess we'll find out. Okay, we got ourselves a pert problem, so get your shampoos ready. <laughs> hmm, 
All we have to do is just type stuff in one zero 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 zero. That's ten thousand, right? It sure is. E to the is this guy right here, second LM. And remember, when you're using your rate, you have to use the decimal form. So point three is point zero zero three times uh, ten, because that's how many years that we have. And now it's just a calculator exercise. And so <laughs> after all that time, we gained three hundred dollars. Good job. Banks are a ripoff. You just you just use your money and put it in gold. By the way, point five four five rounds up to fifty five cents because we're dealing with money, baby. And you're wrong. You made like three hundred bucks after ten years. What a waste. So this becomes $10,304.55. Remember, it's money, so round appropriately. Using that information, how long would it take for the amount of money to double? Well, let's set up this similar equation here. If the amount of money doubles, then I'm going to have 20000 equals 10000 E to the RT, what was R? 0 0.003 T. Divide both sides by 10,000. Divide both sides by 10,000. And you become a nice two. So two equals E to the 0 0.003 T. Let's ln both sides for when I do it makes the E go away. So if we ln both sides, that leaves me with ln of 2 equals 0 0.003 T. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run to my calculator, find out what ln of 2 is, then divide that by 0 0.003, and then I'll get T. All right, so we're going to do two steps in one because of the math. Uh, after we ln both sides, we have ln of 2. So that's the first thing that I'm going to do, hit enter. That gives me that gross-looking number right there. Now, in order to get t all by itself, we divide both sides by 0 0.003. So I'm going to do that, divide by 0 0.003. And it's going to take us <laughs> not long at all. 231 years to double our $10,000 at that rate. Again, banks are a ripoff uh, just by pogs and, or beanie babies. Remember that trend? People thought you if you bought a bunch of beanie babies, uh, you know, it would be worth something later in life. Didn't work. It's going to take you 231 years and a few cents in order for you to double your uh, investment. Gross. All right, didn't take us long at all. Just, you know, $231 and a little extra dollars, years and a little extra. So, you know, you'll die like 15 times and you'll be able to double your investment. Oh, banks, you get us every single time. Curse you. Don't tread on me. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. Don't put any negative comments in the comments for saying that. Okay, please. Or do. It doesn't really matter either way I get money. All right. That's that. Uh, one more, then we'll wrap up unit two of AP Pre-Calculus. So pretty exciting stuff. Thanks for watching as always. Love you so very much. Bye. <laughs>Finishing up Unit 2 in AP Pre-Calculus. We're going to talk a little bit about some exponential log stuff. We're going to talk about semi-log plots. The freak is that? We'll find out. Let's talk about two things. The first thing that I want to talk about is uh, logarithmic sign graphs. Now, a lot of times you will be given a problem where you're given that. And you're asked to find out when is this positive? When is f of x greater than zero? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do that. This is f of x, and I care about when f of x is greater than zero. Let's get a marker that actually works. So we have log base 2 of 3x has to be greater than then zero. Let me scooch that over. Now, what I'm going to do 
is for me, it's difficult to navigate around logs, especially if I don't have a calculator on me. So what I'll do is I'll take the to the, to to the, to to, where are we at a ballet? If I, that's my joke. Uh, if we take two to the of log two, two to the log two just gives me whatever's left over here. So three X. So three X is going to be uh, greater than two to the zeroth power. Wait a minute. Two to the zeroth power is just one. So three to the X is greater than one. I have to divide both sides by three, divide both sides by three, and X is going to be greater than one third. Okay, pretty simple. Now with this, I don't have to make a sign graph because I basically just have uh, something friendly like three X is greater than one. I don't need to make a sign graph. Now I will later, but this makes sense to me. Logs look like this guy over there. So it would make sense that if this was log base two of three X, which is very similar to this guy, it would cross over at around one third. Now here's where you have to be careful, okay? I have to include the possibility of negative values from time to time, okay? I care about where 3x is gonna be positive. So, you know, I don't have to, if x is greater than one third, I don't have to look back in here and say, oh man, I'm really nervous that if I plug in like a negative number, I have a log of a negative, that's not happening here. So later on, we will probably have to worry about what happens if I get a negative value? What do I do then? We'll take care of that. And if for some reason, what we do requires us to make a sign graph, like if for some reason this was not, um, you know, as simple as three X is greater than one, if it was something like three uh, X squared minus 27 is greater than zero or something like that, that's when we would have to use like a sign graph. But we won't do that right now because we're not doing that right now. Other thing that we have to take a look at is semi-log plots. Now let me move my face. Let me move my face. Did I accidentally just draw? No, I didn't. Now a semi-log plot takes a log and makes it look straight, like a straight line. We know that if I were to graph this on a regular coordinate plane, two to the X, you know, I would get, um, let me see, two to the, and by the way, this is exponential. So logs, exponential, it's going to take an exponential or a logarithmic function and make it look like a straight line. So if I were to plug in zero, I'd get two to the zeroth, which is one. If I were to plug in one, I'd get two. If I were to plug in two, I'd get four. And if I were to plug in three, I'd get eight. And then do I have another shot to do one more? Can I fit 16 on here? I can. And so what we get, right, is a very <laughs> steep, a very steep curve looking exactly like that, but, you know, more like that. Now, if I were to graph out on a semi-log plot, you might be looking at that and saying, what, what the heck, what's all these like little lines scooch next to each other? You'll see. If I were to plug in zero, I'd get to the zeroth power, which is one. If I were to plug in one, I'd get two to the first, which is two, that guy. If I were to plug in two to the second, I would get three, four. If I were to plug in three, I'd get two to the third, which looks like it's going to be you. And if I were to plug in four, I'd get two to the fourth, which is 16. So here's 10. That would be 20, according to my semi-log plot. That's 20, 30, 40. So 16 probably is somewhere at around there. If I were to plug in five, I'd get 32. So here's 10, 20, 30, 32 looks there. So as you can see, a semi-log plot takes something that's a logarithmic function or an exponential and makes it look like a perfectly straight line. I'm not going to draw a perfectly straight line at risk of making myself look even more stupid after doing that right there. But if I were to keep going straight line, straight line, straight line, that's what a semi-log plot does. It takes a logarithmic or exponential function and make it look like a straight line. So what do I do with all this fun knowledge? Uh, I'm going to solve. Now, no calculator, okay, no calculator, but, you know, no calculator needed. I have a base of four and I have a base of eight. What I could do is give both of these a base of two. 
Okay, so if I wanted to make both of these a base of 2, that would be 2 squared to the 3x minus 3 is going to equal 2 to the 3rd to the x plus 7. Okay, and then you distribute up here. You do, when you have an exponent multiplied to an exponent, you multiply, so that's going to be distributed property right there. So that's going to be 2 to the 6x minus 6. That's going to equal 2 to the 3x plus 21. Now, when you have a base equaling the same base, you set the exponents equal to each other. So I have 6x minus 6 equals 3x plus 21. And now it's an Algebra 1 problem. Subtract 3x from both sides. 3x minus 6 equals 21. Add 6. 3x equals 27. Divide by 3. x equals 9. Okay? Similar with this guy. Now we know a rule that says that log, uh, <laughs> that's an LG, log base B of B to the X allows the B's and the log to cancel out, leaving you with just an X. So this is what I'm going to do. Uh, log base 6 of, let me see, 36 is 6 squared. So 6 to the 2x equals 4. Hmm. Log base 6 of 6 goes away. 2x equals 4. Let me see, if I divide by 2, carry the 1, multiply by pi infinity, multiply pi infinity, good. Mm, not bad. Not bad. Not bad at all. Now it gets bad. All right. Well, I saw a problem like this in slide number two. So LNs, I wonder if I can combine those. Oh, I can. So that's going to leave me with LN of x squared minus 9 over 3x plus 1, and I care about when all of this is positive, so greater than 0. Not greater than or equal to, greater than 0. What I'm going to do is I'm going to e to the both sides. You might be thinking, should we factor that? No. You'll see. e to the both sides. So I'm going to e to the both sides. That crosses that out and leaves me with x squared minus 9 over 3x plus 1 is greater than e to the 0. That's 1. So greater than 1. Hmm. Oh, I know what I can do. I can multiply both sides by the denominator. Like so. And that leaves me with x squared minus 9 is greater than 3x plus 1. Okay. Let's get this side equal to 0 because this looks like a quadratic and maybe I can solve it. I don't know. Let's subtract 3x from both sides and 1 while we're at it. So subtract 3x minus 1. And that gets us x squared minus 3x minus 10 is greater than 0. In other words, positive. Uh, ooh, x minus 5, x plus 2. Now, this harkens back to unit 1, where I would give you maybe just something that looks like this and ask you to do it. And so what you would do is you would say, well, this is a parabola. Look like this. Okay. And I have to find the zeros, which I just found at negative 2 and 5. And so my picture is going to look like this, where it's positive over here, it's negative right here, and it's positive over here. 
So where are my guys positive? Well, the X values that make this positive are less than two and greater than five. I'm sorry, less than negative two, but wait a minute. I can't plug in negative two into here. If I plug negative two into there, that would be three times negative two plus one. Uh, three times negative two plus one is a negative. I can't take the LN of negative. You don't count. I can't count you. So the only numbers that do count are as I, if I plug in five, I could plug in five, five squared minus, I could plug in five. The only numbers that do count are five and above. And if that's the case, you give it to shove. <laughs> Rounding joke. Remember that? Anyway, uh, since it's greater than and not greater than or equal to, I'm going to put five non-inclusive and goes all the way to infinity. That's my domain. Okay. That's my X values that when I plug it in, I get uh, a positive value. Again, you're allowed to plug in five because if I plug in five, that's 14, ln of 14 is legal. That's 25 minus nine, which is 16, ln of 16 is legal. I wasn't allowed to plug in negative two because if I plugged in negative two, neither of these would work. That would give me four minus nine, ln of a negative is not legal, can't do that. Okay, so only you would work. Careful, please be careful, I beg you. Solve the inequality, log base four, of 2x minus 1 is less than or equal to 2. All right, so let me rewrite it out so I have a little bit more space. Log base 4 of 2x minus 1 is less than or equal to, leave some space, 2. Why leave some space? I want to get rid of that log. How do you get rid of that log? Take 4 to the of both sides. That crosses out and leaves me with 2x minus 1 is less than or equal to 16. Okay, add one, add one, cross you out. 2x is less than uh, 17, divide by two, divide by two. x can be less than or equal to 17 over two. Now here is a problem. If I were to just circle that, that's me insinuating that I'm allowed to plug in all these negative values, which I'm not allowed to do. But I'm not also, I'm not just going to say that my guy is between 0 and 17 over 2 either, because if I plug in 0, 0 minus 1 is still not allowed. So what's my domain restriction? Well, I have to make sure that whatever I do, that guy is 0 or greater. So if I set u equal to 0, 2x minus 1 equal to 0, add 1, divide by 2, x equals a half is the minimum value you're allowed to plug in. Okay, so the minimum value I'm allowed to plug in is 1 half, and I'm putting the little bracket there because of that or equal to, and the maximum value I'm allowed to plug in is 17 over 2, with the bracket as well. So with logs, you just have to be a little bit more careful about domain restrictions, what you're allowed to plug in, what you're not allowed to plug in. Take in the information that you're given. Take that information and say, am I allowed to plug in all of those values? And no. Am I allowed to plug in all of those values? No. Well, if I'm not, what do I do? Take it from there and see, see what you can do. Okay? All right, fun. 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 No calculator needed. Oh, and my face fits snugly right there. The initial population of a group of 300 rabbits doubles every month. Neat. Those rabbits. Write an equation in logarithmic form that models this scenario for our rabbits and M months. Okay, so this is what I need to do. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to start out by writing this out as an exponential function. So why? equals, you start out with 300. So, you know, remember exponential form is your initial guy times whatever your ratio is to the X power. So that's your common ratio. That's what you start out with. A is what you start out with. So that's 300. My common ratio is doubles, which means two to the X power. That's not what they want. Also, they want me to say R. And by they, I mean me, because I made this problem up. Two to the M. All right, write this out in logarithmic form. 
Okay, well, if I want to write this out in logarithmic form, first off, I need to get the exponent by itself so I can take the log base 2 of it. So if I divide both sides by 300, I get r over 300, just like the Spartans, equals 2 to the m power. Okay, uh, if I want to log this, which I'm going to do, I'm going to log both sides, and I'm going to make sure I log base 2 both sides. So log base 2, merp, merp, log base 2, merp, merp. Why log base 2? So it does that. And so I'm left with the equation. M is all by itself, so I'll start M first. M equals log base 2 of r over 300. Okay. Use the equation to find how long it would take for the population of rabbits to be 2,400. Okay, I can do this. Uh, m equals log base 2 of 2,400 over 300. Wait a minute. 2,400 over 300, well, that's just 8, isn't it? So log base 2 of 8. Oh, man, I wish I had a calculator. I can't do this without a... <gasps> 8 is 2 to the third power. So I can write this out as log base 2 of 2 to the third power like so. And log base 2 of 2 to the third power allows these guys to cancel out, giving me just three. The answer is three months. Oh, those rabbits. An outside factor has changed the population so that it triples every three months. Okay, so that if it triples every three months, so then I have a new equation. So uh, I start out with 300 anyway, so y equals uh, 300 still. That doesn't change. Uh, triples makes that 3, and every 3 months is not going to be 3m, but m over 3. That way, every time I hit a 3-month, that's when the exponent is taken. It's very backwards looking, but trust me on this one, trust me on this one, trust me on this one. Write a new equation in logarithmic form. So I'm going to do the same thing that I did over here. Uh, instead of y, I'm going to use r. So let me quick back that up, make that an r so that it looks better, and see what the difference between these two equations is going to be. First thing I'm going to do is divide everything by 300. Divide everything by 300. So I have r over 300 is going to equal, you're gone, uh, 3 to the m over 3. Now I want to get rid of that base the same way I got rid of that base. So I'm going to log base 3 of both sides, log base 3 of both. That's supposed to be a parentheses. Log base 3 of both sides. That allows this to cancel out, giving me log base 3 of r over 300 equals m over 3. If I want to get m all by itself, I'd multiply both sides by 3, multiply both sides by 3, and putting this all together, m is going to equal 3 log base 3 of r over 300. Lots of threes. Is this a calculator problem? No, no calculator, no calculator at all. Uh, why is the data exponential and not linear? Well, what do I do? Do I add by the same number every time? No, I multiply by the same number every time. So this is exponential. Before, yeah, you know, leave it at that. You multiply everything by three. 
Okay, that is not going to change. So non-consecutive equal length interval input values. I think I nailed that. You times by three every time. So that's why it's exponential. Okay, you multiply three. Multiply three. Write an equation in y equals a times b to the x form. So exponential form to fit the model. This is what we begin with, and this is our multiplier. A is what we, we, bleh, what we begin with at time 0. So when x is 0, y is 4, so a is 4. B is our common ratio, our multiplier. So since we multiply by 3 every single time, I get 3 to the x equals y. And if you're a little paranoid, if you're like, well, how do I know it's 4 and not 12? Just test it out, see what happens. If I plug in 0, I get 3 to the 0, which is 1. 1 times 4 is 4. If I plug in 1, I get 3 to the first. 3 times 4 is 12. I did it right. Okay, now what I have to do is kind of work my way a little backwards. Okay, what is y when x is negative 4? Well, y is going to be 4 times 3 to the negative 4. Or... 4 times 1 over 3 to the 4th. Or 4 times 1 over 9, 27, 81, 1 over 81. Or 4 over 81. No calculator needed. We need a calculator for that. Come on. calculator again. Uh, oh, same exact data. Okay. Uh, 0, 4. So let's graph 0, 4. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 12. So here's 10. Remember, once I skip up here, I now have 10, 20, 30. So 12 is probably going to be right around here. 2 is going to be 36, so there's 20, there's 30, so 36 is right around here. 3 is going to be 108, so this would be 110, so 108 is going to be like right there. 4 is going to be 100, 200, 324. So just make believe that there's a straight line cutting through all of those. Use that graph to further explain why the data is exponential. Well, I'm not going to write it out because I don't have space, but this data is exponential because when I graphed it on a semi-log plot, I got myself a straight line. And that's what you're supposed to get. If it's exponential or logarithmic and you graph it on a semi-log plot, you're going to get a straight line. If you graph something that is not exponential or not logarithmic on a semi-log plot, you're not going to have a straight line. Simple. Simple. Except that it's very complicated because no one uses semi-log plots. Ah, yes. Now we're finally at the calculator section. So let's kind of analyze, let's deep dive these problems. Uh, I really can't move my face anywhere. Nope, 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 nope. So I'm just going to put you here for now. The table shows the average life expectancies in years of Americans from 1900 to 2010. Use logarithmic regression to fit a model to these data. Let x equals 1900, x equals 2 is 1910, etc. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw this into my calculator. You're going to be 1, you're going to be 2, you're going to be 3, you're going to be 4, and I'm using these guys, and I'm going to use what's called ln reg, which is a logarithmic regression model. Well, this is going to be pretty unpleasant. First things first, we're not actually using the years. They want us to use 1 instead of 1900, and so they're giving us 12 sets of years, so we're going to number 1 through 12. So we are going to do what's called logarithmic regression. If you didn't see what I did, and if you've never done this before, make sure you hit Stat, Edit, and then you're going to just type these numbers in as ungodly as they're about to be. All right, so 1900, the life expectancy was 47.3 years. I'd be dead in seven years. I mean, um, 27 years, uh, then 50, then 
59.7, we're trending in the right direction, 62.9, uh, 68.2, where are we? We're halfway through, 69.7, any typos? Yep, yet, I mean, nope, <laughs> I meant to say yep. All right, and we're moving, and we're moving. And we're moving, and we're moving. All right. Oh, almost, almost blew it at the very end there, 78.7. Okay, so we're going to use a logarithmic regression to fit a model to this data. So the using the numbers that they wanted us to use, and again, three would represent uh, 12 or 19, 20 or something like that. Oh, we're going to quit out of this. We're going to go to stat. We're going to go to calc. And am I going to need to use this equation later on? Yes. So what I'm going to do is I am going to go to uh, logarithmic regression, which is ln reg. Okay. It is ln reg. Logarithmic regression uses ln, not log. I'm going to make sure that when I store my regression equation, I store it in the y sub 1 so I can use this later. So I'm going to go to vars y vars function y sub 1 and calculate it and I get this pretty gross looking equation so it's going to look like 42.527 plus 13.858 ln of x. All right so the equation that I got was y <laughs> y equals uh, 42.527 plus 13.8588 ln of x. And again, I stored that into my uh, y1 plot. So uh, I can then answer B, which is use the model to predict the average American life expectancy for 2030. Now, I do this in the video, but I'm also very clear that if you're 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, then 2030 is going to be 14. So I'm going to make sure I understand that 2030 is when X is 14. And I say that in the video. Just watch. All right, now if you remember, I already programmed that into the Y sub 1 part by using the whole VARS thing when I did LN reg. Uh, and I'm going to predict the life expectancy for 2030. Now, since we allowed 1 to be 1900, and thinking back most recently, like tell you what, let's just do this just to be on the safe side. If I go back to my list, we called 2010 12. So 2030 is going to be 14. So if I go to the y equals thing, there's my equation. Graph's not going to help me out much. But what I want to do is if I hit second table, I care about what happens at 2030. So I'm going to go to 14. And at 14, people are expected to be 79.0098 years of age. Hmm. All right, man, people be living up to 80 years old. So we get 79.098 years. Mm -hmm. It's a long life. I don't know if I want to live that long. I mean, <laughs> I, no, I don't want to live that long. All right, next guy. Maybe I can move my face. I can. Another calculator problem. A population of bacteria in a Petri dish is modeled by that equation right there. Very continuously compounded interest formula E. Uh, P of T represents the population at time T in hours. E is E. We're going to start out by saying, all right, well, let's have t equal 10. So basically what I'm going to do here is I'm going to throw this straight in my calculator. 1,000 e to the 0 0 0.05, 0 0.05 times t, which is 10. So for this guy, you might remember this looks very, very, very similar to the continuously compound interest formula. And that's basically what this is. This is a continuously compounded change. Okay, it's an exponential function. What we're going to do is we're going to type in the equation, y equals 1,000, e to the is right here, second ln is e to the 0 0.05, which tells us we have a rate of 5%, times x, 
And if I hit a graph, it's not going to give me anything because of that 1,000. But I don't really care about that. I just care about the population at t equals 10 hours. So if I hit second table, scroll down to 10, we have our guy. Okay, so our population uh, at 10 hours of this bacteria is going to be 1648.721. So the number that I get is 1648.721, but what I don't do a good job is explaining that we're not gonna have like half of a bacteria or 0.7 of a bacteria. So we'll round this up to 1649. You're allowed to have a little bit of uh, rounding error as long as it's just by one for AP pre-calculus, it's all good. So how long would it take for the population to triple? Well, I start out with a thousand, so tripling would take me to 3,000. 3,000 equals 1,000 e to the 0.05t. Now let's divide everything by 100, 1,000 I mean. Let's divide everything by 1,000. You get 3 equals e to the 0.05t. In order to get T all by itself, we need to LN both sides. So I'm going to LN three, and I'm going to LN this E, which it makes it all go away and leaves me with LN of three equals 0.05T. So I'm going to run to my calculator. I'm going to type out LN of three, get a number, divide both sides by 0.05. That's going to give me my T in time. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do to answer this guy is I'm going to find out what ln of 3 is, if I can just get out of here in one piece. ln is there, so ln of 3 is that. Now, ln of 3 equals 0.05t. If I divide both sides by 0.05, I get my answer, and that answer is going to be, what are we doing, months, hours, 21.972 hours. So since T is in hours, we're going to have 21, which is 9 plus 10. Wow, gross. 21, better looking 21.972 hours. So almost 22 hours. The Taylor Swift special. How relevant, Taylor Swift. Oh, speaking of Eagles, Kelsey. Hopefully they're together still. If this video is three years old and you're watching this and you're like, no, nah, they broke up and she already wrote five songs about him. That's a shame. They were a cute couple. Cute couple. Who, where can I move my face? Oh, perfect. Gross though. The Richter scale is a logarithmic scale used to measure the magnitude of earthquakes. The formula to calculate the magnitude M of an earthquake is given by that equation right there where A is the amplitude uh, measured in micrometers, T is the period measured in seconds, A is, I already did that, M is the magnitude, period, and K is a constant that varies depending on the location and the instruments used, whatever. Suppose an earthquake occurs with an amplitude of A equals 100 micrometers and a period of 0 0.5 seconds in a region where K equals 3.5. Find the magnitude of this earthquake. You're just plugging stuff in. You're just going to plug stuff in. M equals log base 10. That's what regular old log stands for, log base 10 of A, which is 100, over T, which is 0 0.5. Figure out what that is, plus 3.5. Type that in your calculator. Be right back. All right, so this looks a lot more unpleasant than it really is. All you're doing is just typing stuff in. So don't do anything stupid. Uh, log is log base 10, so log is log. And I have 100 divided by 0 0.5. So we'll just type out 0.5, close that, and then we're going to add... Uh, 3.5. And that is going to get us 5.8010. That's our magnitude. Magnitude uh, it measured in, I don't freaking know. 5.801. Now suppose the amplitude of the seismic wave doubles while the period remains the same. Calculate the new magnitude. So basically it's the same exact guy. 
but the amplitude A doubles, so now you're going to have log base 10 of 200 over 0.5 plus 3.5. Let's see what happens there. Now, the only difference between this one and the last one is that I have a 200 instead of a 100. So let's do this little trick. If you hit second, enter, it brings back all the stuff that we just typed out. So let's go over here and make it a 200 and hit enter. And that's our new value, 6.102. So by doubling what's inside the log for base 10, it doesn't really change a whole lot, hardly at all. And that's because, you know, when you take 10 to the stuff, right, changing the inside by what seems like a lot double isn't going to change the whole thing by a ton. Okay? Getting all these weird shadows on my face. Oh, so no matter where I sit in this classroom, I'm just out of luck except for when I teach the students. <laughs> Last problem. Look at that semi-log plot. Ooh, perfect. Use the semi-log plot to write an exponential equation. So I'm going to take these numbers here. I'm going to throw that into my calculator. I'm going to find x, x reg, x reg to come up with an equation. Let's see what that equation is. All right, so this is going to be a mess. A lot of this is going to be estimation, so don't expect perfection here. Semi-log plots are good because they try to make it accurate, but when you get a picture stolen from the internet like I do, it's not going to be super accurate. And what we need to do is we need to turn it into exponential equations by doing exponential regression. So stat, edit, we're going to start out by doing negative 2 and then work our way up to 4, like so. And then it's just a matter of trying to figure out where things are. Now, negative 2, I'm going to do this. Negative 2 looks like 1.4 out of 10. And if you type out 1.4 out of 10, it does the calculation for you. So similarly, if you're looking at negative one, and if you're saying that's a little above the three, so maybe like 3.5, then type out 3.5 tenths, and it does the math for you. Zero looks like it's right on one. Two looks like uh, if you were to, no, I'm sorry, one. I forgot about one. That would make a huge difference. Uh, one is like above two, maybe two. 2.7, so we'll go with 2.7. Uh, 2 is like 7-ish, so 7 point, we'll make it 3, because that dot's kind of hovering above. 3 is now like right at 20, so I'll call that 20. And then 4 is, uh, that's the 50s, so a little above 50, so we'll say 52. Okay. Now, just for funsies, just for funsies, let's stat plot this to see what it looks like on a coordinate plane to see if it looks log or exponential, uh, which is what we want to do. So I'm going to turn second y equals, I'm going to turn the stat plot on, and then I'm going to zoom stat, which is zoom nine, and that looks pretty exponential to me. So let's come up with our equation by quitting out of that. Let's go to stat. Let's go to calc. Uh, will I need my equation later? Yep, so next part I'm going to need it. So I'm going to do exponential regression. I'm going to make sure that I store my equation into y sub 1 by going to vars y vars function y sub 1. When I calculate it, I get gross. But you know what? Oh, man, that is awfully close to 1. Awfully close to 1. I just missed it, though. Um, so I will have the equation uh, y equals 0 .993, 0 0.994 times 2.7019, and that's awfully close to E, uh, 2.7019 or 702 uh, to the x. y equals 0 0.994 mm, times... 2.702 to the x power. Friends, even though I didn't say it, and even though it's not what we did, using the numbers that I chose, 
what we basically got is this is basically the same as this. Now, don't do this. Although I'm allowed to because I created the problem. This is the same as y equals 0.994 if I'm estimating is 1. 2.702 is awfully close to e. So this is basically y equals e to the x. Isn't that neat? Now, I'm not going to use that. In fact, what I did is I programmed in my calculator that it would go automatically to y sub 1. So I'm still going to use these values right here. But that's what this is. Now you know. <laughs> Isn't that neat? Isn't that great? So much fun. Use this equation to predict the output when the input is 10. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to use that equation right there. I'm going to let x equals 10 without having to type that whole mess in. All right, now that I have that, I can see what happens when my input is 10. So I'm going to go to graph. There it is. I'm going to go to trace. Uh, if I can hit it again, second table, not trace. Go down to 10. Ooh, see what number that is. 20602.094. So this ended up being 20602.094. Yuck. Rewrite A, the red part, as a logarithmic function. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to, oh man, I wish I could use E. I wish I could use E. I wish I could use E. Oh, should I do it? Should I do it? I'm going to do it. I'm using this equation. I'm using this equation right here. Try and stop me. It's my video. I made it. Y equals E to the X. Okay, I'm going to write that out as a logarithmic function. Well, all I have to do if it's y equals e to the x is I can just ln both sides. You know, I can just ln both sides. And what that does is it cancels that out and lets that be x equals ln of y. Finding Dory ln degenerates. And I'm done. So uh, that wraps up the chapter. Make sure you watch the other videos to get you ready for this chapter test, whenever that is, if your teacher is going to do that. But uh, yeah, lots of logs, lots of exponential stuff, some semi-log plots. Very strange, very strange, but a lot of fun. All right, guys, thanks for watching. Love you all. Mm, bye.